welcome to Bangladesh. Um, and uh, it's a real privilege to be hosting this workshop. You know, it's an international workshop on our senior pond culture. And, you know, un until a couple of years ago, um, or until very recently, I mean, there was no real thinking, no thought about culturing of Artemia in Bangladesh. And now we have more than 10 countries participating in the workshop. So thank you all for attending. It's, uh, it's a real privilege. And it's great to see the wider participation of you know, government, non-government, Artemia farmers, hatcheries, researchers, everybody out there uh, from so many countries. I mean, you're aware that you know, Bang Bangladesh has got a large exporter of shrimp um, and seafood product, uh, but completely dependent on the importation of Artemia cyst. And indeed, I think last year, something like 4 million euros were spent on the importation of, uh, of cysts. And it is a real constraint, um, not only in the cost, but in the quality for a lot of the, uh, a lot of the enterprises here. But you know, over and above um, those involved with hatcheries um, and uh, seafood grow out, I mean, there are over 30,000 salt farmers here uh, whose livelihood, depend, livelihood depends on you know, low income, low crude price salt. Um, and you know, there was never any thought of integration with any other activity. Um, so not only are we helping the private sector here, hatcheries, et cetera, et cetera, but hopefully benefit you know, over 30,000 families who are involved in the salt pans. And of course, COVID-19 has, uh, has increased the misery of many of these farmers. And, and of course, for Mizan and Patrick and others involved in this project here made um, the progress uh, difficult. Um, although uh, Mizan has been overcoming that, and many thanks for your efforts, Mizan. Um, so, you know, until about a year ago, 18 months ago, there was no thought of anything to do with our team here. And, you know, it's down to Patrick and Mizan with EU support. Um, we've got this uh, project going, it's a pilot project, but my understanding it's been uh, some initial success over the last couple of months, which I'm very pleased to hear. Um, and, you know, I hope it will open up the scope for, uh, you know, improved food and nutrition security here, increased incomes for many, and improve the livelihoods of many, of th of many thousands of salt farmers. Um, so I don't want to speak for long. Um, behind me, I have a couple of, uh, couple of photographs in the office here, one of small-scale cage culture and one of um, climate smart agriculture over ponds. So hopefully next time I speak with you, I'll have a nice photograph of our team here being produced in Bangladesh. I know from personal experience, I've not had much, uh, much success in growing Artemia for my tropical fish. So I wish you all uh, a lot more luck than I have. But, uh, and I've also asked uh, Mizan to bring me some, uh, some Artemia with a decent uh, hatch hatchability. But anyway, uh, I wish you all the best and thank you for joining. And I will, uh, I've got another meeting now, but I will join you later on. Some of the videos look fascinating. And uh, yeah, this, this is a really interesting and innovative project. So thank you all for your support. So best of luck and take care, everybody. Thank you, Mizan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris, for your great inspiration since the beginning of the project all the time. Always all the support. We're really enjoying it. And I'm very sure that you will keep continuing supporting Artemia project. That is a real privilege for all the people, staffs of Artemia project. We really uh we really inspired with our contributor direct involvement with this project that's great so let me to go to the according to the agenda so the now the professor patrick sarglos from Ghent university who is uh uh right word should be maybe the proof of uh, atmia in bank in the world so he will be give us a short presentation about uh, history of corn production of Artemia cyst and biomass. So, Patrick, do you like to share this screen by yourself, or I should share the screen? You, your screen sharing is also fine. We can see it nicely, no problem at all. Thank you, and uh, hello, everybody. Um, wonderful uh, opportunity to be with uh, so many together in this uh, first international workshop on Artemia pond and tank production. Uh, uh, it is thanks to the uh, EU project uh, in Bangladesh 
uh, or headed by uh, World Fish that we have this uh, chance to organize this workshop. I will give a very brief uh, introduction and uh, make sure that we have plenty of time to uh, listen to the other uh, presenters. Uh, it all goes back, in fact, to uh, 1976 when FAO was organizing the first technical conference on aquaculture and where uh, at that time it was uh, stated that the uh, Artemia situation was critical because there was only provision of Artemia from uh, two sources in uh, uh, the United States of America. Um, I had a great opportunity through uh, FAO to uh, uh, spend uh, quite some time in uh, the uh, CIVDEC uh, center in uh, uh, the Philippines. And honestly, it is uh, um, referring to the uh, um, uh, late Herminio Rabanal that uh, he believed in uh, what uh, we had developed at a very small lab scale in Belgium, that this should be verified for application in tropical conditions. So when it is uh, uh, during these periods, 1976, 77, 78, that uh, we were looking into the possibility to use the seasonal salt operations, like you see in a number of the countries there uh, at the bottom of the screen. Uh, it's a monsoon climate, natural artemia cannot occur, but if uh, you do stocking uh, in inoculation at the right time, and of course do the proper management as we will hear how it is done in a number of countries, one can have a uh, successful production of both uh, cysts and biomass. A number of other countries uh, have joined later. Uh, this was here in uh, Gujarat in India, uh, uh, one of the first with successful business uh, production was uh, Thailand, as we will hear later on. And then a lot of work, as we will hear from uh, uh, Hoa, from our friends in Vietnam, a lot of uh, research, a lot of uh, development work uh, to uh, control the uh, cyst production, to control the biomass production. So I'm referring to all these presentations where we will hear uh, more details. And I link up with what uh, Chris was just mentioning. I think, and we start to see it in a number of uh, Southeast Asian countries and Africa, and hopefully in a number of others in the future, that local availability of Artemia can be a catalyzer, uh, can really create uh, good opportunities to see new developments or improved uh, uh, applications in marine and brackish water uh, aquaculture. And even if you think about the catfish uh, 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 countries like uh, um, uh, Kenya, where uh, uh, African catfish is popular, the local availability of artemia can also help in the hatchery production. Next to the pond culture, where of course most of the attention is going to, uh, also in uh, uh, this uh, day of uh, uh, workshop presentations, there is tank culture. And uh, uh, it was in fact one of the um, priority activities back in the 1980s when we were uh, uh, developing tank culture of Artemia in uh, Belgium. Um, and where we developed uh, a number of applications, stagnant uh, batch culture, uh, uh, open flow through culture, closed flow through culture. And I'm happy to uh, uh, see that we also will have a couple of presentations on new developments uh, and in fact improved developments from uh, what we have done uh, uh, 30 and more uh, years ago. Uh, and it is indeed spectacular how also in uh, tank cultures uh, you can uh, really have uh, uh, very good production results. Okay, maybe at a higher cost indeed, but uh, this is where I think we will see with uh, the circular economy, with uh, how we should uh, take more advantage of using byproducts in uh, agriculture. I think there are real opportunities to see how effluents, for example, from desalination plants, how byproducts from distilleries, from, from agricultural uh, crops uh, could be converted into uh, a high quality uh, uh, protein into uh, Artemia biomass. And who knows, look, this is uh, uh, two old papers I'm referring to back 1987, 
uh, that tank culture could also be considered for uh, uh, nucleus uh, production. I like to draw your attention to maybe uh, a filter system that not many of you are familiar with, but this is a, a unique system uh, if you want to do a tank culture. Um, maybe in the discussion we can come back to it. It's the welded wedge screens. And it is these that uh, really make it possible to go for a, a daily production of nuclei. So countries where, and I'm thinking, for example, Malaysia, that uh, these could also provide opportunities to produce uh, a daily amount of nuclei uh, for the facilities. And who knows, maybe uh, now that um, we are looking into uh, um, knowledge on the Artemia genome, maybe knowledge on uh, uh, which uh, uh, genes are critical in selection in uh, improving strains of Artemia, but uh, using in the meantime, a patent uh, that is more than 30 years ago, so it's open in the public. Uh, the key to uh, induce uh, Artemia to produce cysts is by regular every so many hours, dropping the oxygen content, stimulating the animal to, pro to produce hemoglobin, and in fact come to uh, very nice results of uh, uh, the quantities of cysts, as you can see here at uh, the bottom of the screen. Thank you very much. Uh, I think this is sufficient as a, an introduction uh, to this workshop, and I'm really looking forward to uh, uh, the presentations. Ms. Anur, back to you. Uh, thank you, Patrick. Uh, so it was a nice introduction. Now the second speaker from uh, is me. So I will give an introduction about and purpose of the workshop and the scope of collaboration. Let me to share my presentation with all of you. Just a few seconds for your patience, please. The, the project's name is Introducing Circularity Through Climate Smart Aquaculture in Bangladesh, in brief, Artemia for Bangladesh. I welcome from, uh, on behalf of my team, Artemia for Bangladesh team. The first, uh, the presentation covers introduction of the project, and it will also the purpose of this workshop and the scope of collaboration. As you know that uh, according to recent statistics, 26 million people is undernourished in Bangladesh and it is one of the most vulnerable country for climate changes. Almost 1 million Rohingya refugees are in Cox's Bazar, causing price inflation, unemployment and environmental degradation. Cox Bazar plays an important role in Bangladesh economy for food salt production, aquaculture, fisheries and tourism. As you also hear from Chris that about 27,000 hectare land and also 50,000 artisanal fa salt farmers are involved in salt production. Profitability in artisanal salt production has been decreased, declining due to cost of land, labor of labor and inputs. Marine aquaculture growth ha has been also hindered due to limited availability and expensive imported Artemis cyst and biomass. Shrimp and prawn hatcheries are restricted in coastal areas of, of Bangladesh because availability of high quality brine will be useful to set up inland hatcheries like Vietnam, similar to the example of fish and crustacean hatcheries. The objective of the project is to enhance food and nutrition security in Bangladesh through climate smart innovation. The specific objectives are introduce an integrated salt and artemia production system, increase marine aquaculture production and productivity in the salt farms. The expected results are Artemia and salt production systems proven feasible, effectively established, and widespread in different areas of Cox's Bazar. Marine aquaculture production and productivity increased due to availability of low cost and locally produced Artemia. Increased revenue of salt farmers due to adoption of profitability activity like aquaculture, shrimp farmers, farming, fish, crab, tilapia, and other cell and species. And enhanced marine aquaculture sectoral value. The project here in the left side, you can see the map of Bangladesh. Our neighbors are India and Myanmar, and of course, in the South Bay of Bengal. In Cox Bazar, there are seven sub districts. In all sub districts, there are a lot of salt farms except Ukia. So, we plan to work in all the sub districts where in Cox salt farms are available. As you can see, also, even it is one district in Bangladesh, but there are islands also. Some, there are very remote areas as well. How the project is going to intervene? The main mode of work is the capacity building. 
capacity building of improving technology for in artisanal soil farms and also capacity building in hatchery and nursery. In artisanal soil farms, we plan to produce artemia and cyst and biomass production, which will go to the hatcheries. And also the hatcheries will be supported for pathogen free high quality artemia shrimp and prawn post larvae, which will sub support for marine aquaculture production and productivity. The project intended to support marine and saline tolerant species like crablets and marine fish fry. The, the intervention way is to demonstration, training and extension and research and innovation. Demonstration for Artemia cyst and biomass production, aquaculture in soil farms, recirculation system in shrimp hatcheries. Training and extension include training of trainers, soil fish farmers, hatchery technicians, extension agents, local service providers, young professional development. For research and innovation, we focus on climate smart technologies development, application of locally produced Artemia cyst and biomass, improved seed quality and availability, hatchery nursing rearing, rearing techniques. Here in the photographs, you can see first of this year, locally produced Artemia cyst. Our farmer is also harvesting Artemia biomass, and we plan to enhance marine aquaculture sector value, including shim, prawn, crab, tilapia, sea bass. These are our target species. And in Bangladesh, we do have also SPF monodon hatchery. Now their number is three. And there are soft shell crab farm also in Cox's Bazaar. The stakeholders involved, international stakeholders, domesticated stakeholders, and other domesticated stakeholders, like yeah. Laboratory of Aquaculture of Artemia Reference Center, Ghent University, Kanto University. We also plan to work together closely with Ministry of Aquaculture, Agriculture and Cooperatives, Department of Fisheries of Thailand. Domestic stakeholders include Department of Fisheries, Bangladesh Fisheries Research Institute, Bangladesh Aquaculture Technology Innovation Platform, Salt Stream Farmers, Crustacean, and Fish Hatcheries. Other stakeholders include like BISIC, Bangladesh Small and Cottage Industries Corporation. They are the pioneer in salt production promotion. Non-government organizations, Shrimp Hatchery Association of Bangladesh, Bangladesh Universities, Frozen Food Exporters Association, Bangladesh Shrimp and Fish Foundation. So the purpose of this workshop is to exchange knowledge, information of, on Artemia culture, enhance national and international collaboration, strengthen the network among the stakeholders involved in Artemia production. The scope of collaboration is research on climate smart aquaculture, for example, Artemia, shrimp, crab, marine fish, in improvement of appropriate technologies for hatcheries, grow out, and small scale farmers learn sharing from each other experience and multi-stakeholder en engagement. Like in this workshop, you can see the hatcheries, farmers, researchers, policy makers are joining. So here I acknowledge in 2015, when Petri came to Bangladesh, we visited the salt farms where we initiated this project idea, although it takes five years to launch the project. So I acknowledge Professor Petri Sorglos's contribution. I also acknowledge European delegation, Mr. Manfred, who supported Mr. Dario, who is the contract person and other people in the European delegation here in Bangladesh. Also, Mr. Christopher Price, candidate or Wallfish, who have been supporting the project since the beginning. Thank you very much for your joining, for your sharing uh, also. Now I will go for next speaker from Wallfish, uh, Mr. Binoy Barman who is the senior scientist on Wallfish. I will share his uh, slide with you. Give me a couple of seconds, me, please. So thank you, uh, Mijan, and welcome everybody uh, in this session in my presentation. Actually, my presentation is a bit uh, covering uh, other areas rather than technical, uh, which I try to cover about the social, gender, and the policy aspects of uh, implementing this RTMEA for Bangladesh project. So basically, uh, the main purpose or goal of our uh, doing any kind of activities connecting to aquaculture or fisheries or improvement of hatcheries, uh, either through Artemia production or uh, through other way of uh, development is mainly to uh, actually feed our people. And most importantly, uh, I can mention here that uh, this is actually to meet up the hidden hunger of the people. Uh, this is connecting to malnutri uh, malnutrition, connecting to micronutrient, and, and also connecting to uh, uh, food uh, less uh, because of uh, sufficient food they are not getting. 
and you have already heard from the presentation from uh, Mizan that uh, all in Bangladesh case, there are quite a significant number of populations are still below uh, uh, poverty. I think they are uh, facing a lot of problem in getting uh, good amount of food or good nutritious food and uh, so we have uh, we have taken we need to take much care of that kind of areas in doing any kind of uh, interventions like the one of them is the artemia project so what do we do in the artemia project basically uh, we are working with the soil farmers so soil farmers are very very poor people and they are malnourished people so many difficulties they have they are living in the vulnerable context so doing anything for them is also very, very important. And in that case, the social issues, the issues of gender, the policy issues are very, very important. So if you look at this uh, figure, this is the figure about the, uh, the way Bangladesh is progressing in terms of the inland open water uh, uh, captured fisheries, as well as inland cultured fisheries, and, and also uh, from the uh, marine, uh, marine fisheries. And especially in case of culture uh, or aquaculture, we have a very rapid, rapid progress. And I can tell you here that the Artemia for Bangladesh project, what we have initiated here, uh, this will give another momentum if we are very successful. It will actually create a big momentum in the upcoming years uh, if we are very well successful. To take our uh, aquaculture forward, it may be related with the uh, shrimp and prone-based aquaculture. It also marine fish-based or fin fish-based aquaculture as well. So this is, I we feel that uh, this is very, very important. And in, in case of aquaculture development or fisheries development in Bangladesh case, we are really making a big progress. But now I think in order to go forward, this kind of development we throw the project and also the engagement of all uh, uh, as a, like an inclusive way of going through this kind of development is very, very important and crucial. And in that regard, the policy issues, the social issues, including the gender issues or gender equity are very, very important. So what are the major problems in Bangladesh? Basically, uh, we, you know that Bangladesh is already self-sufficient in the production of uh, fish. We are also uh, self-sufficient in production of cereal crops and several other uh, other kind of food uh, food based product. But what is the problem? The problem is that there is still there is a big gap between the rich and poor, and there is also a gap uh, between uh, uh, man and woman, uh, woman and man in the same household in terms of the getting the nutritious food or even sharing of food uh, within the household as well, especially for the vulnerable areas uh, uh, where our project is actually implementing in Cox's Bazar, uh, the people who are the salt farmer to whom we are actually involving in the Artemia program, program they are basically, uh, we can, if we can look at, there are so much uh, uh, behind with respect to the uh, good food, good nourishment, etc. So what is the, uh, what is the things uh, uh, we need to do? We need to work more closely with them so that the people, uh, we can actually overcome their uh, problems of uh, nutrition as well as also their income levels. But the point here I, as a problem, I can tell you that there are some shifting or transformation happened earlier also in that area, connecting to the shrimp production or uh, which is like uh, many people uh, in that area also growing shrimp. But again, this also created a lot of disparity in terms of the sharing of benefit, also become uh, access and as well as many other problems. So what has happened, the poor become poorer or uh, they become in a more critical situations. So that's why when we are doing in this project, we are right from the beginning, our aim is to look at more on these areas that there should not be any uh, differences or uh, uh, that means the poorest, uh, the Poorest of the poor or poor people who are the salt farmers not lag behind uh, of this uh, opportunity. We know that this project will support a lot for the hatcheries, for the shrimp farmers, they will get a lot of benefit and also the uh, marine fin fish uh, producers or hatcheries, they are all become these people maybe. But the point is that uh, we should not ignore the other people. So it, it will be like a combination of all, like a uh, inclusive kind of uh, uh, action through this program.
So that's why I think we are uh, right from the beginning, we are looking at that issue very uh, important. So uh, as already Misa mentioned that uh, the area where we are working, there, there are a large number of poor household with uh, subsistence living standards and very vulnerable to the natural hazards. Uh, the lot of cyclones and many different kind of natural hazards frequently happen. So they are very, very uh, vulnerable. So major uh, source of their income is uh, salt production, but also they do some kind of small scale fisheries, depending on small scale fisheries and small scale uh, aquaculture, very traditional based aquaculture. And the figure, if you look at the figure, 90% of the total salt production is actually, 95% uh, uh, is coming from this area. So they are actually contributing a lot in terms of supplying the salt. And there is a huge number, uh, 30,000 to 50,000 uh, uh, households uh, who are salt farmers and their total number of population is 1.5 million who are actually depending on this for their livelihoods. So salt, uh, salt farming, uh, as Mizan already mentioned about that, this is a very, uh, very, very, again, is a very, uh, not very economic kind of activity always because there are a lot of uh, climatic factors actually hampered the salt production. So they are, again, also vulnerable with respect to salt production as well. So some kind of alternatives uh, uh, is very, very important in this kind of context. And certainly I can say that uh, the uh, this project area, the as much as we can diversify the their source of livelihood or income uh, level, uh, income earning sources, this is very, very useful for them to uh, take this uh, kind of situation or tackle this kind of situation and to become more uh, 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 good life and good uh, uh, livelihood. Now, what are the potential opportunities here? Because you, we know that uh, from the literature survey, we know that uh, the other countries by this time, especially there are examples of Vietnam, where those people who are involving in the salt uh, farming uh, uh, and doing the Artemia seeds production, they already have improved significantly their uh, status with respect to socioeconomic uh, conditions. And we also have an example of uh, Artemia seeds production in the northern eastern uh, Brazil. So we are certainly expecting that our Artemia for Bangladesh project, we expect that it will improve the socioeconomic conditions of the salt farmers in Bangladesh. But surely we need to look at that we should not. Uh, uh, we should be careful about. Very careful that uh, there should not be any disparity happen. That rich become richer and the poor become poorer. So that part is again. I we I emphasize here that we need to take care much on it uh, when we look at the potential. So the potential opportunities uh, also uh, we can just I think taking into account we we feel that uh, right from the beginning the social issues the gender issues the. Uh, or even the policy issues are we are looking forward for uh, taking into actions in this project with more uh, seriously in addition to the uh, success of the technical interventions. So what we actually uh, want to do, we uh, wanted to uh, uh, work with other projects or programs. In that area, we know that Wallfish, yeah, uh, other project also, there are two other big projects also working in that area on aquaculture promotions and other value-added product development. World Food Program is also working in that area with the host communities because already uh, Mizan mentioned that it is area with Rohingya. One million Rohingya people are also like a burden in that area. So, uh, uh, so to, to support the local people, the government has taken a lot of measures, a lot of institutions or national and internationals are supporting there. So, I think in doing that, they already build up several uh, groups, women groups, also poor people's groups, a uh, lot of IZA based groups. So in our work, what I feel that, or we feel that we will actually work together with them, taking into account their approaches, their way of working, and then we can go forward with, uh, with the salt farmers who are now going to be a, uh, the Artemia farmers. So as a, as a activity, basically I can uh, bring here a little bit uh, uh, brief about that we are already doing a good baseline because anything we want to intervene uh, in terms of the social, gender or any other issues, we need to know more about what is the current situation in terms of there. Because in Bangladesh, so uh, although it is a small country, there are a lot of variations like other countries with respect to the social gender and with respect to the 
uh, geographical and uh, environmental uh, conditions. So what do we uh, try to understand about what is they what they have and what are their difficulties, what are their potentials, what are the differences they have with respect to gender, with respect to the well-being. All these things we are collecting through an extensive survey. We are also uh, uh, doing, trying to uh, do uh, studies, several studies I think already designed to look at more on uh, the issue of gender. That means how the gender equity can be wrong, how the uh, women empowerment issues can be uh, more extended. So all these areas we are uh, trying to understand and then based on that understanding, we try to apply the uh, the outcomes into into that area and together with others, as I mentioned, so that they can develop uh, their capacity. And through these capacity building events, the uh, process, they can actually build up their confidence. Thank you. Okay, so uh, in terms of the finally, I wanted to tell something about policy issues because we know that uh, uh, Wallfish, in collaboration with the food and agriculture organizations, is going to work on uh, with the Department of Fisheries, Government of Bangladesh, and other organizations as well to update the national fisheries policy of 1998 uh, in the context of broader policies like uh, Vision 2041, Delta to 2100, uh, NPAN, and also a country investment plan and others. So uh, Artemia for Bangladesh, we in this project, basically as Mizan mentioned that we are working with the government, we are working with the private sectors, universities, and also in the national and international level in different arenas. So uh, what do we feel that this is a golden opportunity that we throw our work and as we have taken the initiative to update the national fisheries policy, many of the outcomes and of, uh, of this work can be also, we can take into account in, uh, in in uh, contribution to the national fisheries policy. And I hope that if the national fisheries policy, if we can contribute, that will make a big change in the short term, long term, uh, or medium term basis uh, through investment and through incorporation of different stakeholders in the law in, the, in Bangladesh. And Bangladesh in, uh, in 2041, as we said, that we want to be a, a developed country uh, so we can actually successfully run in that direction. With, uh, thank you very much for patient hearing, uh, uh, and thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Binoy, uh, for your nice presentation covering social, gender, and policy issues. Now, the next speaker is uh, uh, Mr. Noguen Ben Hoa from Vietnam. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone uh, from Vietnam, because now we are almost uh, 2 p.m., uh, 2 and a half p.m. Um, first of all, I would like to say uh, thank you for uh, invitation uh, to join this uh, workshop. And uh, in fact, first of all, I uh, prepare a talk uh, on Artemia palm production in Vietnam. But uh, a request from uh, Professor Sogolut and uh, Mr. Noa, I'm going to add some more slides about tank culture. But uh, because tank culture is not really developed in Vietnam yet, but at least you know how the activity looks like. So uh, uh, I'm uh, going to uh, quickly to jump into the pong production because this one may be interesting to some of you. And uh, later on, we can share from uh, each country about this issue. Um, like Patrick Sholot just explained that uh, the country in Southeast Asia, we have no academia uh, naturally. So therefore, in the need of aquaculture development. So then uh, we have to introduce the academia tend to the collaboration between Gen University with Professor Sholot and the Inter University same year of uh, um, 84, 96. And actually, that also the moment that I'm joined with the research and application of, of Artemia in aquaculture. Uh, more of you know uh, where is the country and where is the location of uh, the Vinjau area. But for those if you really want to visit, uh, now with the problem with the pandemic, you still can go with the Google map where I put the coordinate over, the, over here. So then you can see that it just stay in the coastal line of uh, uh, the Mekong Delta and Vietnam. 
uh, like other countries in Southeast Asia. Um, in the south of Vietnam, we have only two seasons. The rainy season lasts from November to the end of April, and uh, rainy season May to October. And uh, normally during the rainy season, the people are uh, busy with the soil production. And that's the only activity that they can handle in order to take care of their life. And in the wet season, for the traditional culture of uh, shrimp and fish, and of course, uh, it's quite low productivity in that moment. Uh, you can imagine that uh, the whole family, they can live with only one US dollar per day. It's really a very difficult situation for the local people at that moment before we start with the Artemia project. So the figure here to pick up the information where you can see that the uh, total culture area, the total production and also the productivity per hectare per crop or per season. The figure over here to illustrate that, that they are go up and down because of so many factors. But for those who uh, would like to start, you can see that we started the Artemia project in the country with the traditional system where uh, with only a few hectares, a few pond with a low production at that moment and not so many family involved. And later on, we uh, switched into intensive culture where we're taking care of with more of the culture condition, especially that the fish item for the Artemia culture system. And then uh, nowadays, we apply with the intensive uh, culture system and then uh, bioflock technology have been applied as the mean in order to uh, provide the feed particle and also to set the environment. Um, like I told you that um, the production or the total culture area has been go up and down. It depends on a number of factors. But recently, uh, there are almost um, 800 up to 1,000 hectares with uh, almost uh, seven, 800 families involved and they, they can produce up to uh, 20 tons of um, artemis seed per year. So that uh, figure to bring up again, during the year of 90, uh, we started at the beginning with uh, almost 200 hectares for 100 uh, families and later on they, they have been in green. Um, but last year, because another uh, negative impact, like we have abnormal weather, and this happen everywhere in the Southeast Asia country. And especially that we have also now with the farm, with the wind farm project, they are also uh, uh, occupy a lot of uh, culture area of Artemia. Anyway, you see that uh, how the figure of production of Artemia and the size of Pinchao go up and down. So, uh, some of you may have seen already the um, uh, culture system. In fact, in Binchao and Bac Liu, we have tried with several production systems of uh, Artemia. But uh, finally, we decided to have the monoculture system with the conduct stagnant or static system where you can have that uh, in a farm you may keep at least 20% of the culture uh, area a fertilizer pump in order to get enough green water to uh, pump into different activity pump a food. And another idea you should uh, uh, keep in mind that uh, the diagonal need to be coincide with the revealing wind locally in order to facilitate for seed collection. And of course, what the pump we try to manage the water level uh, a deep as possible. And of course, this is not that easy because you know that normally in uh, the source area or salt production area, uh, high saline water is not that uh, much. So therefore, we have to increase the water level from time to time. And because of the higher temperature uh, to the end of the rainy season. Uh, a recommendation for the Artemia rower is we try to keep the water level up to 40 or 50 centimeters from the left floor. 
Alapate explained that uh, we started the project in 1985 and uh, still the activity is still going on. And you may see over here that uh, uh, the number of factors have been uh, deeply studied year by year. Uh, we go from, uh, we uh, focus uh, a bit earlier with the fertilization pump uh, where we can make the green water available to uh, add the nitrogen for uh, free and also CDK. Uh, later on, we look at the soil, the water, and we look at the seed quality. We also look at the social economy. And uh, nowadays, we're still busy with the biolog technology applied for Artemia production in, in the pond. Um, now, uh, we uh, already have the formulated fish which have been uh, made from the Third University and it seems to be that it very suitable and it appropriate for RTB form production. And of course, the, um, at the time being, we are considered a supplementary food. Uh, it's not 100% food applied to the form yet because it got, but uh, it will have a lot when you're going to do the culture and the tank. Uh, you can uh, feed into the pond when the rain water is not available. Besides, another item also has been uh, focused during our study uh, recently. So uh, in short, you can uh, say that uh, if you really want to have the high production of seeds, or uh, now uh, we focus also on biomass, we have to pay much attention for the uh, palm culture technique. For the water quality, there are a number of items that we have to take in care and uh, to look at the palm bottom because actually one culture technique uh, could help to enhance the seed production in, in that uh, location or that uh, area but uh, may not successful to uh, the other new location, then we have to adopt it. So this is in short to uh, give you an idea that how the Artemia seed production has been um, managed or maintained in the culture area of uh, Pinchao and Bạc Liêu. So normally if you started to have the rice seed for incubation to get the inoculum and from the moment that you inoculate into the pond and normally it may take 10 to 14 days then the female going to release either seed or napia. And I heard that in Kokwasa uh, with Misanua that you can have uh, even the seed appear after nine or 10 days. So it means that uh, the local condition in Kokwasa may be even more suitable for Artemia to develop. Um, nowadays, we uh, start to focus also for biomass collecting and what I'm going to her from Tanang or from Thailand, because now um, the biomass production in Dinjau is still uh, in the small scale, uh, not because of the market, but uh, because the farmer used to produce this, so therefore they not uh, really think about uh, if they're going to enlarge or extend the Artemia biomass production. But uh, we have it. You see that in the pond when we cannot uh, continue with seed production, a uh, farmer switch into uh, biomass production and they just uh, to show how they collect it and also put in the harbor net and clean it up before they put in different form like uh, the system from Tanang where I have visited uh, years ago. We have a live biomass, a chilled one and also a frozen one. Um, this figure again, it uh, is the current uh, reduction cost in uh, Finchow and Bạc Liêu, but maybe uh, it's not the reduction cost in your country. But anyway, uh, you can see that uh, normally in order to run for one hectare of Artemis culture in Vietnam, we need almost 1,500 US dollar for operating cost. And uh, recently with the survey from Dr. Tới, uh, to mention that uh, the cost for the reduction of Artemia may be in different uh, elements. But where you can see that the cost for the seed, for the inoculum, and also the feed, 
two of them already sometimes go up to 70% of the production cost. So uh, if we can save or if we can reduce the cost, it means that we bring up the chance to make higher profit for the producer. Um, recently, uh, if the local farmer, they follow the traditional production model, so they can have the income up to the 1,500 up to 4,000 US dollar per, per hectare. For those who can invest a bit higher, they go with intensive culture system, then the total income may be from 7 to 10,000 US dollar per hectare. And you may uh, like to hear that what about the crop right, on farm crop right for the seeds produced in Vinchao and Bac Liu. Uh, recently, at almost $30. Per kilo. Of course, this is the wet weight. And the same for biomass, it's almost 0 0.7 yard dollar per kilo of wet weight. And of course, normally that the farmer they can sell up to uh, two or three times higher compared to what they have uh, spent to produce for one kilo of seed or biomass. Almost uh, 1,000 families involved for Apimia production in Sopran and Bac Liu, Gavin and Benke at the time being. So we have a few slides with uh, mention about the tank culture. We have also Raceway, uh, what we have learned from uh, Gen University. And we have decided with the composite of plastic or lining or cement tank. So this uh, decide in uh, more of you when you're engaged with us. With biomass culture, you may know about this system. So we can go up uh, from 100 liter to two keep repeated, keep salinity like seawater. Uh, with different stock in the city, different kind of food. Um, and uh, the point is we try to maintain the food available and to keep the good water quality throughout the culture. Uh, for this system, we produce the biomass not high like Patrick uh, had mentioned before. Uh, and up to now, we can produce more than two kilo per cubic meter uh, after two weeks or three weeks. And for those who are interested with the seed production in the palm, you also can produce uh, with the amount of 100 grams of seed per cubic meter also after two, three weeks. And the cost here, get the price for production of uh, biomass is really high. It's uh, almost four to five dollars per kilo in wet weight because many more cost uh, compared to the pump production including. So we found that there are also uh, advantage and this also advantage when we handle the pump production or the outdoor production of Artemia and Big Chow and Bac Liu. There are a number of items to save the time, so I just want to mention what the, the main item that we are consider it uh, may play the main important role. Uh, for the advantage, we see that uh, in Big Chow and Bac Liu, and soon I'm sure that another country, they can produce the high quality seeds for domestic and export market. For the disadvantage, again, so many uh, items, but over here, nowadays, we have to face with the weather uh, condition. I uh, mentioned here the weather dependent, for some climate change, unusual rain, too cold or too hot, etc. And these are the problem uh, interfere so much. Uh, for your information, you know that in this season in Vietnam, the production of Artemia seed only one third or even less compared to regular year because of the heavy year. And for the tank culture, uh, for the advantage, we, uh, if we, you could produce the biomass in the tank, of course, that's very good that we can have the biosecurity and the farm biomass, like hygienic condition, the side different nutritional content and therapy for uh, aquaculture species. But the disadvantage is, is very high production cost, especially for the England hatchery. Then uh, you have to buy the saline water uh, and the cost for transportation is quite a lot. 
So um, since we started in the year 80, up to now, uh, we have a contribution of the activity to the community. Initially, uh, Vinja Optimization has been revealed by Kanta University since 1986. But uh, recently, if you uh, visit to the site, there are a number of private sector are now available, like Vinja Optimization Cooperative, Bakli Optimization Cooperative, another company, and they could reveal up to 20 tons. Uh, it can uh, have the value up to four million year dollar per year. So what we're going to do next? Uh, again, we uh, put uh, different item over here, but uh, we do concern with the weather uh, change recently. So therefore, we try to adapt to the climatic change, like to store the saline water and to counter at low salinity. You know that before when we do the, the training into the farmer, we on the time we have never to stop or to inoculate Artemia when salinity let down 80 ppt because of predator. But nowadays, uh, if we continue in such a way, maybe that the rice season becomes shorter and shorter due to the climate change. So therefore, we have uh, implementing the project where we can start on the to capture the atmosphere at the salinity of uh, 50 city ppt. Of course, you have to get rid of all the predators to make sure that the atmosphere could develop. Then we continue to develop the atmosphere fish to integrate fish, uh, sorry, to integrate atmosphere uh, intensive way with stream farming to focus more on biomass production. Uh, for the tank production, we try to reduce the production cost and also we try to integrate with the indoor intensive stream culture by using the effluent. Like, I like the term that uh, Patrick uh, mentioned, like the extractive aquaculture, where we can consider that effluent from the stream or feed from a uh, food available for Artemia culture. So we start the Artemia activity in uh, Vinchao and Bac Liu since 1986 and up to now still busy with, with different activity from research, education, training, and extension. And at the time being that I'm myself very happy that we can share my knowledge to all friends or regional country where we can apply the success uh, story of Artemia culture in Vietnam to your country. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hoa. Thank you, Hoa, for your presentation. Could you please stop screen sharing? I would screen sharing from my here. Yeah. The next speaker is uh, is Mr. Samsuga Gadan Nathan Kandan yeah. from India. Yes. I will uh, share the presentation I, from my is computer, please. So that would be actually Mr. convenient. Rama. Please, good afternoon. This is the organizer of this uh, international workshop. This is a, just a quick review of uh, our resources of, in India. We have a very long coastal line, more than 8,000 kilometers, and we are having the EZ 2.02 million square meter. Continental shelf is there, and brackish water 1.2 million hectare, and freshwater area is also plenty in India. We are third largest producer of fish in the world, and second largest aquaculture producer of of China and the fourth largest exporter of marine products. So the scope for the Artemia aquaculture India, India requires about uh, 250 to 300 tons of dry Artemia cyst annually. This is mainly to meet the uh, 450 registers, hatcheries, stream hatcheries, also fish hatcheries, besides ornamental fish aquaculture India. The, you know, Artemia and apply very well. Everybody knows that uh, is having a lot of nutritional, uh, uh, this one for uh, helping the uh, larvae. And India has around 2 million uh -huh. hectares of salt works along the coastline. And uh, salt cyst, the cyst can be produced in the existing salt pan area scientifically with a suitable modification. And uh, I would like to mention here that the gender issue, because mostly in India, uh, self help human groups are very much interested to take over these projects. Uh, next, please. The requirement of Artemia cyst for various aquaculture species. We just had a 
survey uh, it is 3 to 5 kilos is required for 1 million sim uh, peels and like that 10 to 13 kilo for prawn um, and 3 kg of cyst for gobi of fish and 60 to 65 of sea bass like 30 kilo for 1 million medical of instar we want to expect to increase this uh, requirement will be 6 to 10 folds within 5 years hence the empata marine product export development authority is in uh, are doing this uh, project. History of Artemia Aquacults in India, Artemia Pathogenetica is available in India, but it is uh, not a size, is not a preference since we thought better to start the pilot scale Artemia project. Thanks to Dr. N. V. Ho, who Canto University was given the technical consultancy to Yambada RGC in 2012. Since then, we are standardizing this project. Now we are having uh, two projects we implemented uh, in India. Next. So this is the one of the sites, Taravikulam, uh, is in Tamil Nadu, the southern uh, end of the Tamil Nadu, where the salt pans are more. And we initiated this project. This is the total area, uh, around 6.75 hectares. This is the average productions. Uh, we are getting 150 kilo uh, raw cyst from per hectare from crab and dry uh, uh, crop. Dry cyst is around uh, 168 tins. We are getting, uh, even biomass we are getting, so this is all like you uh, know one uh, per ten we is uh, selling it to 47 us dollar and frozen bio biomass is the 5 us dollar per kilo and challenges is unusual rain climatic changes and uh, birds and the predation also we are facing the same problem next this is the uh, just uh, the graphical representation of the artemia productions over the period of 2007 to till uh, still now it's going on there are fluctuations is there due to climatic changes and other issues but still we are standardizing this technology. This is the second project we have initiated uh, in the Upur. This is also near the southern part of Tamil Nadu and is doing well. And the production is uh, going on very, uh, what are the expected level. Next, this is what the productions we are doing uh, in uh, almost 10 hectare areas. This is totally under the Ministry of Commerce and Industry was given this project. And almost 150 kilo raw cyst per hectare per crop used to do it. And biomass also we are doing more than one ton, and uh, this is what the our uh, production details uh, around 47 US dollar we are selling per tin, and frozen biomass is five uh, US dollar per kilo. So this is the uh, another project how this uh, cyst and biomass uh, ratio we are producing over the period of time 2016 to 2021-22. So there are some fluctuation in the cyst in uh, 2020 2021 because of the climatic change over the biomass is coming up. The process flow of the Artemia culture, as Professor uh, Host said that the same incubation of the cyst is all well known. Inoculation of the nopply, observation of Artemia, algal supply and feeding supplement, and management of the Artemia ponds and cyst collection and biomass harvesting and processing and packaging. I think Mr. Samayakan and my colleagues and Mr. Saju has had been to there in uh, Vietnam and uh, they could uh, see that what the Vietnam are uh, process doing and the same we are replicated here. The steps involved in Artemia culture incubation of the cyst and catching requirements that is a, a routine procedure salinity is this much 35 ppt is required temperature pH and dissolved oxygen level lights and aerations and inoculation freshly hatched and Artemia now place should be the, the first instar stage. Inoculated at the sunset time, the stocking density also determined by the nutrition level and the temperature found in the culture pond. Steps on Artemia culture again monitoring Artemia by visually in the morning before the pond racking. Then we will see that visually how this animal gut fullness and pickle pellets and swimming behavior, animal color and color of the brood pouch, animal appearance, everything we will look into that before monitoring this one. This is the mode of the reproduction. Both cysts as the nopply production is there in our species. And the supplementary feed uh, preparation also we are uh, simultaneously we are doing with the fermented rice bran as feed for the Artemia. This is the feeding Artemia algae also supplying and the supplementary feeding also we are doing outdoor algal culture. Very nicely we made it uh, in the pond and we are supplying to the pond. This is monitoring the physical chemical parameter that is also very vital. Uh, this one important temperature, salinity, pH and depth also playing a major role. So the microscopic observation of Artemia algae composition and other zooplankton because the RGC is the being a research institution. So we are doing almost all kind of uh, research activities also besides racking in Artemia pond. You can see that the women people uh, months are involved in these uh, Artemia productions. 
this is a bad fencing because we have to this very very the bats are uh, is a menace so we have to make a bad fencing of the uh, production area to entry of the predatory bats so biomass harvesting as usual this is the standard methods we are following the biomass harvesting processing and packing and this is what we are doing that system harvesting and processing packing we are having our own uh, a uh, unit uh, how to collect and dry it and pack it and nitrogen packing and uh, uh, go for the sales besides that we thought pl brand artemia because the pl is very famous in the tutukuri area that's what pl brand artemia we have made it and dried artemia flax we made it and decapsulated artemia cyst also we made it and other by products the ongoing research on intensive artemia farming htp line pond recently we have started we can't we do it in the htp line pond and it is uh, giving the good results the future plan is the standardized the intensive artemia farming technology for indian climatic condition and commercial scale of artemia production units in gujarat and other state improve the indigenous rice's production up to 25 tons per annum that means 10% of the total indian requirements because we want to meet the requirement of our indian uh, hatcheries so as a uh, marine product export development authority coming under ministry of commerce has uh, given the fund for complete value chain established in india for artemia aquaculture now we have to expand the area i take this opportunity to thanks the professor dr patricks and also dr ho and uh, dr rahman uh, for giving this opportunity to present about the artemia aquaculture in india thank you very much so thank you dr kanan for your presentation is the i have not received presentation from uh, mr nasir from iran so uh, he can if he is available he can present from directly hello mizanur Oh yes, Nasir. Nice to see you. Thank you. Yeah, nice thank you for joining. So the floor is yours, Nasir. Please. Yeah. So I can share it. Please allow me to share myself. Okay. Is it okay now? Yes, we can see it. Uh, once again, thank you very much to uh, Patrick and Mizanur for inviting me to this. I am Nasir Akram Ulmia University Artemian Aquaculture Research Institute. Uh, I've been involved in Artemia study and research last 26 years, and uh, I did my PhD under supervision of Patrick Sorgulos in Ghent University. And since then, I've been knowing a number of people who are uh, present in this uh, workshop, and also I'm happy to see new faces. So I will give you some introduction, a brief introduction about the pond and tank culture, culture of Artemia in Iran. So. Uh, about the historically, if you look back uh, in 1986, for the first time, Artemia Franciscana was introduced in the uh, province of Kerman in a, in a big pond. Uh, it was only, it, it was active only for two years, but they had to stop it due to the mismanagement. But even in those two years, there was a good production of about two tons. Uh, the rice is per hectare, uh, for, for whole pond of about 30 hectare. Uh, which was sold in the market, in local market. But the tank production in Iran, uh, we, we did some, but it was not continued for uh, in large scale. However, currently also some places they are doing it. Uh, but for the first time, we did it uh, as a national project in 1997 to 2000. It was an inten intensive and super intensive production of Artemia Urmiana in 1,000 liter polyethylene tanks and 5,000 liter concrete tank. It was good, uh, we had good results, about five kilogram of bi Artemia biomass uh, in each 1,000 liter was produced. Uh, in current status, if we want to have a general look, uh, there, are, there have been lots of attempts to produce Artemia or to culture Artemia in different parts of Iran. Uh, in the coast of wherever the salt water were available, in the coastlines of Persian Gulf, Oman Sea, Lake Urmia, even the running salty waters and uh, salty groundwater. And scattered all over Iran from north to south, east to west and central parts of Iran. And three species are being currently even used for production of Artemia in Iran. That's Artemia franciscana both strains, GSL and uh, San Francisco Bay, Artemia urmiana and partenogenetic Artemia. Uh, currently, but only 200 hectares of, are active, but it's go, uh, growing very fast, which I will give you in uh, the, uh, everything in detail. 
Uh, currently, tank culture is done only in some parts of Iran where big aquarium fish hatcheries are located, and they are doing it, producing it mainly for themselves, and all of them are working with Artemia Franciscana. So this is the map of Iran. You see that we are a neighbor with a number of countries around, and of course, we have the uh, Persian Gulf and Oman Sea. In south of Iran, uh, Caspian Sea in north, and uh, Urmia Lake is located here. And of course, there are many salty lakes and running salty waters, and on the, and ground salt waters in different parts of Iran. So I have to. We have been working almost in everywhere. So I will give you the samples of different ones. See, this is one of the first one which we, we did. It was in 1998 in South of Iran here, uh, just in the uh, uh, Khuzestan province near the Caspian, uh, near, sorry, near the Persian Gulf. Uh, there was a contract with a private company who was interested in con culture of Artemia. We had uh, to just prove that Artemia culture is uh, possible. So in 10 small pond, uh, ponds of 2,500 square meter each, the water depth was, was 80 centimeter. Water was pumped from Persian Gulf. In this area, the Persian Gulf water is about 42 PPT salinity, which had to increase to about 65 PPT by evaporation before the starting. Chicken manure and, fertilizer and chemical fertil fertilizers were applied in both Artemia and algae ponds. We didn't use any extra feeding here. Artemia Franscana GSL was introduced. At that time, we had only this one. The aim, I said, was to prove, and it was proved, there was good production of uh, Artemia in this area, which uh, the investors could, uh, could go farther for the production in larger scale. Then in uh, just near the uh, Ormia Lake in this area, we also had a contract with the Iranian fishery organization, and they were interested to uh, to produce Artemia near Lake Urmia. So we had 12 ponds, each of uh, uh, one third of hectare, and Artemia urmiana and partenogenetic Artemia were used for the culture, four ponds for uh, algae, eight ponds for Artemia culture, water depth was about 60 to 80 centimeter. We pumped the water from the Lake Urmia at that time, the salinity was about 120 PPT. That was good enough for Artemia culture, but salinity was reduced in the algae ponds uh, using the groundwater, ground fresh water. And there also we use only algae for the, as a food, no extra feeding, but the production was really good. We had uh, at least 25 kilograms of dry cyst per hectare per month. And that could, of course, in this area, uh, we could produce only for about seven months and two tons of live biomass per hectare per month and the products were sold in local market. In other province, uh, so in Iran, we are having different systems and different types of production. So here, for example, we have a big, large pond in the Kerman province, which is in the deserted area here, that, uh, almost to the center, to the south of Iran, a completely deserted area in the middle of desert using the, uh, the, gr the groundwater, it is a brackish groundwater, but that, that has been collected for so many years and the salinity has increased to more than 90 PPT. So we introduced Artemia Franscana Wing Chao, Wing Chao from uh, Vietnam and uh, the production is going on. So here you can see the air view of this large pond uh, of 35 hectare. Uh, here we are be, we are using mainly grinded fermented wheat bran as a food, and of course chicken manure and molasses are also added to facilitate bioproduction. We don't have exact idea of the how much biofilm is produced here because the pond is big. We cannot have a good control, but it has been used as as a support to the fermented wheat bran. Uh, we don't have much of algae here. Uh, but Artemia density is high. So produce Artemia, biomass and cysts are commercialized within Iran only. The annual production is now two tons of wet cysts and 15 tons of biomass. Mainly they are focusing on biomass. Biomass is catching good price in Iran. In Boucher province, again in this area near the Persian Gulf, uh, we had a first attempt of uh, integrated culture of algae, artemia, and shrimp. 
uh, we hired uh, 81 uh, farm of shrimp farm of 18 shrimp ponds, each of one hectare. Nine ponds were for shrimp, six ponds for, uh, ponds for artemia, and three ponds were allocated for algae production. The average depth was about one meter. Uh, culture water is pumped from Persian Gulf. In this area, it is again about 40 ppt. Uh, but evaporation increases that uh, salinity very fast. Here also we use only algae, but here the main focus was on production of Artemia uh, franciscana uh, biomass just to feed the shrimp directly. That was really good production also. Very, we had very high density of biomass here. Uh, we used chemical fertilizers here uh, for both algae and uh, Artemia ponds. Uh, Artemia was produced in high density, over two tons per hectare per month. There it is hot area, it never gets so cold, so we could produce it for at least 10 months in a year. A few hundred kg of biomass also was sold at that time to the nearby shrimp hatcheries that they could use it for their uh, broodstock. Uh, in this area, another two hectare uh, farm is now under process. In West Azerbaijan, there is again another system here. There was a big uh, site for about 2,000 hectare uh, for the fish production, which was constructed about 50, uh, 25 years ago, but that was uh, not active because of uh, shortage of the fresh water. So since last few years, I have been, uh, I have been asking the authorities that should be, it should be converted to Artemia production. So uh, finally, we could get a, prom a permission to convert 200 hectares for Artemia production. Currently, 100 hectares is active. The other 100 hectares will be active very soon. Artemia urmiana and Artemia partenogenetica is used here. It is interesting that at this area, the, salt, uh, the salty uh, groundwater is very salty, between 90 to 120 ppt. So for the uh, for the uh, algae ponds, we have to reduce the salinity by uh, fresh water, uh, bringing from the village nearby, I mean, by, by a pipeline. Micronized wheat bran and molasses are used here also. Currently, 30 tons of biomass and 8 tons of dry seeds are produced. And here also, mainly, they are focusing on biomass production because they can really sell it to a good price. Uh, another very large system, again, uh, near the Urmia Lake. Uh, this is the uh, Urmia Lake dried area. You, uh, if you know that Lake Urmia was about 5,500 square kilometer, now it is reduced to 50%. That means 50% of the lake is dry. So we separated one part, about 55 hectare of the Lake Urmia by a dike. So this 55 hectare large pond is created. It is for the production of Artemia urmiana. Another five hectare ponds are constructed here in this area for the algae production. Uh, this is at higher level, so algae can be uh, transferred directly with a pipe without any pumping. But the water is pumped here. What we are using as a uh, medium is treated uh, water. Uh, so treated water from the city and we tested this treated water, uh, especially in terms of uh, heavy metals, and that was uh, there, there was no problem at all because this is only the urban uh, treatment, uh, urban I mean, water, so uh, treated water. So therefore, there is no any problem. Uh, but this transfer of this water was very difficult, very expensive. Uh, there, uh, we can. I mean, there. Of course, the money was given by the government. Uh, this is about a pipeline of uh, 50 centimeter diameter polyethylene pipe for 10 kilometer to transfer this water. Uh, and the production, the goal is production of four tons of Artemia urmiana uh, dry cyst and 30 tons of biomass annually. Uh, already com completed, uh, I think from next month or so, the production, uh, we will start, I mean, the activity and the production will come in the next season. So about the co production cost and the markets in Iran, <clears throat> the production cost is not really high in Iran because the human power and consumables are uh, almost cheap, uh, but the final product is costly. 
The production cost for the biomass is estimated at about one dollar per year uh, for uh, one kg, uh, but the local price now for the frozen biomass is 2.5 US dollar per kg, but live biomass costs two times more, that means at least five dollars. So uh, therefore many of the many people, uh, they are focusing on the biomass production because it is easier and uh, they can get more money also. Production cost for the cyst is estimated at about 25 US dollar per kilogram, but the local price is now between 50 to 60 US dollar per kilogram. Uh, which mostly people in, I mean, the farms in the south of Iran is more interested because there they can produce Artemia franciscana. In Iran, uh, we use about 40 tons of dry seeds currently, which are mostly imported, and therefore there is a good intention to start more and more Artemia uh, aquaculture in different parts of Iran. Uh, but we need more and therefore there is no room for the export currently. Of course, now some companies are interested to import cyst, uh, the wet cyst from Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan, uh, process it, and maybe in future they can start exporting to other countries too. The main challenges that we have now is, uh, number one is by, by the Veterinary Organization of Iran because they are uh, prohibiting Artemia culture near the shrimp and fish farms. So uh, effluents cannot be used from those farms mostly. Uh, still, but number two is that still the big investors are afraid to invest in big Artemia projects because in Iran, uh, there are much more easier way of making money. So they don't want to invest on uh, much. They don't want to invest on Artemia culture, which can have its own risks of, in the production. Uh, the other challenge is that the lands are preferably allocated for the shrimp and fish culture rather than for Artemia culture. So we have to always fight for that, uh, but it's getting certainly better. Iranian fishery organization mostly controls and uh, the main policy of uh, aquaculture is has been is designed usually by this organization. It is certainly a government organization, uh, but they don't have a concrete policy now for Artemia culture in Iran. They pro they try to promote it, but they really do not have a concrete policy. Uh, but however, it is getting better every year. Uh, fortunately, technically, we don't have much problem. Uh, having a lot of experience during all these years, uh, but still we have to develop uh, develop protocols for the more intensive cultural system based mainly on bioflock. Uh, but also we need to train more people to supervise uh, the Artemia ponds, which uh, we don't have really much people because uh, only in our institute uh, the students are. Mostly in our institute, the students are doing their thesis, master and PhD thesis uh, on Artemia. So they are the only people who can go around to different parts of Iran and supervise on the production. So uh, the planning for future, uh, as I said, in West Azerbaijan, we uh, are planning to go for another 100 hectare. 200 hectare in the Boucher province, which is ha which already has been allocated and the process is going on. 300 hectare here near the Oman Sea, near Chabahar. Uh, again, the land has been provided and a big company has been investing on this. And the fourth one is in near Hormozgan, near the Bandarapas, again near the uh, Persian Gulf, where there are lots of uh, desalination plants. And we have been we have proposed to use the effluents from desalination plants for Artemia culture. It is still in process, but we are hopeful that there will be good support from this idea. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Naseb. Could you please stop sharing the screen, please? Sure. Thanks, Naseb. My pleasure. So the next speaker is from Montan Tamtin. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Nurse. I'm Montagan Tamtin from Department of Fisheries, and I have the uh, co-authors, Mr. Anantan Sutta Panit and Mr. Tamtin Sangkon Tanakit. 
Yes, uh, the history of uh, Artemia Pond production in Thailand starts in uh, 1977, when the department officially obtained Macrobasium Development Project from FAO. And in order to solve the high price of Artemia seeds that we uh, imported and also want to uh, develop uh, Macrobasium production, that was the first attempt by the Department of Fisheries to produce the Artemia seeds by inoculation of San Francisco Bay strain in 1978. And then in 1979, Thailand was a success in seeds production, which 10 kilograms of Artemia seeds were capable to uh, produce in 0 0.24 hectare earthen ponds within 45 days. Later in 1980, Artemia farming for seeds production was launched by the Department of Fisheries and extended to South Farm in Chonburi, Chak Chung Sao, and Samut Song Klan. Uh, and later in 1992 and 19 until 1926, that was the Artemia project, which is the collaboration between Thai government and Belgium project in order to enhance the application of Artemia in fish and shrimp farms. Yes, the uh, current status now the cultural size of uh, Artemia production in Thailand, located in a major province, major pro pro province. With uh, the first three provinces, Samut Songkram, Samut Sakhon, and Petchaburi, is the major area that have the South Pan. With the South Pan in this province uh, together is around uh, 700 hectares and produce 1 million tons of uh, South. So in Thailand, uh, indeed, they have the potential to produce Artemia. However, the demand of Artemia is a uh, valley. So the the production of uh, Artemia in Thailand now is uh, decreased. Mm -hmm. Yes, I show you this slide is the cultural practice. We are categorized into two major systems, traditional system and developed system. Most of the developed system is in Petchaburi and Chak Chung South, uh, and uh, they modify the shrimp pond for culture of Artemia with a uh, high depth, so it can uh, collect high saline water and it can produce Artemia almost the whole year round. But for the traditional system, they have a ditch and quite the shallow. So they have the problem with the to regulate of the saline water for, for the optimum uh, production of uh, Artemia. For the pond, they have the size quite similar, but uh, for developed system, they have uh, uh, quite a larger, larger pond, like a, a 0 0.32 up to 0. Uh, Seven, uh, nine, seven hectare per pond for management for the tra traditional system they have the less management because they have no, no raking of the pond bottom and they use army as feed by the developed system they are have the frequently raking of the pond bottom which i will show you in the next slide for the harvest technique artemia was uh, attracted by light before harvesting but uh, for developed system they collect by harvest net at uh, early morning, either by the manually or automatic. And this is to show you the first picture is the traditional pond, which is quite shallow. But for the uh, left side, uh, left hand, uh, right hand side, is the shrimp pond that uh, modified to be the Artemia pond. And this farm is uh, from Mr. Tanan. This is uh, I show you the raking board is the uh, because uh, this is the Develop and invent by Mr. Anand Tansuta Khanit because the principle is the Artemia is the filter feeding animal. Hence, feed must be uh, sustained in the water column. By using the raking board, it can eliminate the EP5 algae or unwanted algae like a filamentous algae, and it can also resuspend the feed. So, this uh, technique is uh, adopted to, uh, uh, to an apply for several farms, especially in uh, Petchaburi. And this is the harvest technique. For the first uh, first picture uh, above, they use the light trapping, but for developed uh, method, they use the harvest technique uh, using the automatic, like uh, they use the pattern view to accelerate the water current. Then the water stream can carry the Artemia biomass into the collecting cage and then in the morning, the staff will collect uh, the Artemia biomass for further use. So this is uh, before they, they, they do packaging and uh, to and forcing, forcing, they will stock the 
Artemia and egg primatide is uh, in the 40 up to 50 ppt uh, of uh, stocking water prior to do a pack packaging. And this is the Mr. Tanan farm. He is the Gent alumni and uh, he now he operates his own farm. He also do uh, conditioning of uh, harvested Artemia by the clean it in the, in the tank and he are uh, sell either in the live form or the frozen form and he 70 percent around 70 percent of his production he sell to the the local farms and uh, around 30 percent he export at the frozen uh, pro product and this is the two pack is at the live feed and uh, at the uh, live form and sell to the local market like uh, ornamental fish and uh, let me go into the some more detail about the current production technique. The, we modify the salt pen and shrimp pond with the uh, high depth, and also the the lelling water. We maintain like a two point five up to six times higher than the normal sea water salinity. Normally, they keep uh, around seventy five and uh, eighty ppt. However, during the rainy season the salinity of water will increase uh, from uh, 90 ppt uh, and uh, above. For the inoculation in Thailand, uh, we are no more inoculate with the uh, Artemia seeds. Uh, then uh, we use normally, they use the Artemia by uh, uh, please uh, turn back to the previous slide. Yes. Uh, for the, they use the Artemia biomass from other farms like uh, five to up to six kilograms per 0 0.16 hectare. And for the feed, they use either direct or indirect feed. For the direct, now they use the byproduct for monosodium glutamate, uh, which is the simple and easy to use. Next slide, please. And this, uh, I show you the the right, the the left, uh, the left uh, pictures is the army, and the right uh, picture is the fermented corn that they used uh, like uh, some organic uh, matter or byproduct waste from the other other ponds and uh, ferment, and then uh, they pump off the this uh, water pump what need uh, feed uh, water and feed to the Artemia pond. Okay, this tell you the army. Okay, this is a primary production that they enhanced by uh, using fertilizers or the fermented uh, byproduct from the other uh, other other activities. And this is the halo bacteria, and uh, also like uh, we have got the nanoclopsis or dunalella, and then pump into the uh, Artemia pond. Next slide, please. This is the production. Uh, in Thailand, we don't have the problem with the uh, technique. But just we have the limited of uh, use of Artemia. Therefore, the, the, the demand of uh, Artemia is decreased. Uh, compared with uh, 2012 and now it's uh, current, we can see that the production and also the, uh, the value, production value, it decreased around half. And the total production area also decreased. Like uh, currently, they have like only 45 hectares the the salt the artemia that produced in the salt farm uh, are exclusive in the uh, table. We we just uh, use the information from the monoculture of uh, artemia in the pond only, and uh, the farm is uh, now is around fifteen uh, and to twenty farms. For the production is around ten up to fifty kilograms per hectare per day, and. Uh, they can produce the uh, 200 up to 10,000 kilo kilograms with the uh, average of uh, around 2,000 kilograms per farm monthly. And uh, per year, they, they can produce as high as 120 tons per farm per year. And this is, uh, they can produce more, but uh, just because of the limited of the demand, that's so they have to reduce the, their production for the, Production, uh, they can produce 340 uh, annual, uh, annually production of uh, Artemia. And uh, for, for the production value is around uh, 330,000 
uh, US dollar per year. For the market, as uh, I show you, uh, I told you before that uh, 75 percent just uh, for the local market, and uh, around 25 percent up to 30 percent is to export at the frozen uh, Artemia biomass. Uh, actually, the farmer can produce, uh, they have potential to produce uh, as high as 400 kilograms per, per day. For the selling price, uh, the average is uh, between a live and frozen farm is not uh, much difference, which is around 1.34 1, 1, uh, US dollar for life. And for frozen, uh, the average is around 1.47 uh, uh, US dollar. This for for the land of the Artemia production in Thailand, because now the the, the farmer prefer uh, Artemia biomass and also the the brine water selling rather than uh, produce uh, of uh, Artemia seeds. And uh, for in Thailand, we have the competition with uh, live food and artificial uh, diets, diets and. Uh, also, the live food, the other live foods is uh, cheaper. And in, in Thailand, the farmers, they have no organization that uh, when they have uh, low demand and uh, low, uh, low demand and uh, limited of market. So the small scale farmers, they dumping the, the price. And you can see this uh, in the past, the price is as high as the 2.8 uh, US dollar per kilogram. And uh, for the bright water, is around uh, 20 uh, US dollar per truck. But uh, pre selling the selling price is the decline sharply. So for the, the future, maybe uh, for Thailand, we should uh, apply the new uh, Artemia biomass for the other new species like a uh, marine crab, like a mud crab or swimming crab with the consumer of uh, Artemia. And also, is it possible to, to apply it for human consumption or do the value added? And uh, also, maybe uh, use as uh, alternative protein source for, for animals. Okay, that's, that's uh, on the next slide, please. And thank you for, for on the, the provide me the information. Thank you very much. Uh, so, next speaker is. Uh, Betty Nono from uh, Kenya. Okay, thank you very much. So I am Betty Nyonje. I did my MSc in Aquaculture in Ghent University with Patrick Soglos, and I work with the Kenya Marine and Fisheries Research Institute most of my working life. However, currently I have been seconded to work with the Secretariat for Blue Economy, which, is, which sits in the Executive Office of the President where I also double as a technical advisor on the high-level panel for a sustainable ocean economy. Uh, it's a great honor to participate in this meeting and I would like to thank the organizers and in particular Patrick, uh, who has been uh, an academic father to most of us around the globe for bringing us together. So I will give you an overview of the Kenyan experience in Atemia corn production. Next, next slide please. Next slide. So in Kenya, uh, Timia can only be produced along the salt, salt belt, which is found in uh, a Magarini division of Kilifi County in the north coast of Kenya, as seen here in this map. This is the salt belt, and that is Kilifi County over there. Now the area where this can be done covers about 10,000 hectares of salt works, comprising seven corporate salt farms, and several additional ones. Next slide. So Timia Franciscana was first introduced in Kenya about 36 years ago in two salt works through a bilateral cooperation project in the field of applied research for aquaculture development between the government of the Republic of Kenya and the government of the Kingdom uh, of Belgium. Now, by the end of the project, after two years, Timia had spread to all the salt works the technical feasibility of, a, of local Atimia production had been established, and Atimia was now abandoned in all the salinas of the Kenyan coast and could be considered as a new resource that could be further developed for improved salt production or for use as life feed in aquaculture development. Now, then the 
next phase of this project was meant to enter into commercial exploitation where the economic value of various Atimia products could be evaluated and demonstrated. But unfortunately for us, this did not materialize then. However, Atimia remained within the salt works, albeit without uh, any proper organized management. Now, another attempt to revive corn production for us came uh, through support from the Belgian Inter-University Council about 10 years ago. The project which we named uh, the Own Initiative Project aimed to optimize Atimia pond production by building the capacity of the local scientists and stakeholders with up-to-date knowledge and practical expertise for aquaculture development in Kenya. Its overall objective, however, was to improve the living conditions of the coastal rural communities in Kenya through production and application of Atimia in local aquaculture ventures to create employment and generate income. We had seven partners, including Ghent University, Kanto University, the Kenya Marine and Fisheries Research Institute, and the salt farmers. It was a four-year project that ended in uh, 2014. Now, after successfully uh, completing this own initiative project, we managed to secure funding from the Kenya Coastal Development Project, which was a World Bank funded project. Now, this project assisted farmers, the artisanal farmers, to upscale their farms for pond, uh, Tomia pond production. That was between 2014 to 2016. And this is when we uh, managed real uh, production from the artisanal, artisanal farmers. We have uh, a new project uh, that is funded by the Western Indian Marine Science Association, which started this year. And this, is, this project is aiming to optimize Atimia production using biofloc uh, technology, and it's being implemented in Kenya and Tanzania. Next slide, please. So this uh, Google map, is an impression of the project site. It shows uh, artisanal farms here, and here lies the biggest salt farm, which is over 5,000 hectares of land. Next slide. So uh, for most of uh, the interventions we had, one of the prime objectives was to build capacity, both at the technical uh, and community level. So you can see in this uh, uh, slide, that we started uh, involving the community right from the stage of bond construction. And with some astounding results of expertise that was created when this, when, when this project was done. But in the end, we were able actually to employ some of the community members to manage our experimental ponds. And some of them were actually employed by those who wanted to establish local aquaculture establishments to establish their phones and construct their phones. So it was quite a positive aspect at the community level to build capacity. Next slide, please. So this is an impression of the experimental phones, which we did uh, in, in, uh, in same sizes in order to, to have controlled pond management and, and, and production. Next, please. So, for the pond production, we did very robust pond management in order to attain good production. Therefore, there was fertilization of the ponds, constant stirring and raking, monitoring of water parameters, which we did routinely. Next slide. Yeah, this is another slide showing uh, you know, monitoring of water parameters and inoculation of, uh, of the nauplia above there. Next slide. So uh, we, we did, uh, during our pond um, uh, experiments, we inoculated uh, Vinchow and Kenyan cysts. Now the key tech, uh, and then we did managed versus unmanaged pond production. And uh, from, our, from our results, the key take home is that pond production experiments in Kenya showed that the Kenyan cysts seem to have adapted to local conditions after these 30 years of existence in, in this environment. They actually outperformed the Vinchow cysts from uh, Vietnam 
and the San Francisco Bay Seas. So what we plan to do uh, right now is to do genetic characterization of the Kenyan seas under the current project to give some answers as to the trends in the better performance we saw uh, in, in, in the quality of the seas. So during the optimization, uh, when, we, when, when we did the first experiments and we found the Kenyan seas were better, then we did optimization. And uh, by, the, by the last season, when the project was ending, we could, we could uh, obtain 20 kilograms of cis and 20, uh, per hectare and 20, uh, 200 grams, 200 kilograms of biomass per hectare. Next, please. Uh, the other thing is that um, the Kenyan seas are very similar in size to the San Francisco, San Francisco Bay seas, which are quite small and which is a which which is a quality mark. Here you can see our seas are between one one ninety eight and two hundred and twenty eight micrometers, very comparable to the San Francisco Bay, which is two two hundred and twenty three to two hundred and uh, uh, 38. So here, this slide shows uh, some of the, the uh, awareness creation and capacity building we did. Those field demonstrations for uh, an array of uh, stakeholders, the local communities, salt farmers, and students in pond, uh, timia pond production and field processing of uh, timia cysts. Next, please. So another workshop for different categories of stakeholders. Uh, this is a workshop for production, quality control and application of atemia in uh, uh, aquaculture. Next slide. So we also tried to get the policymakers and potential uh, partners involved. Here you, there was a launch event by our minister, the minister for fisheries then, and uh, different groups of people, including the Dutch, Belgians, Israeli, and Indonesians all came to, to visit our, with a lot of interest expressed. Next slide, please. So the key milestones from all these interventions uh, include uh, the fact that we managed to relocate Atimia in all the commercial salt works after the long period where, where we had no activity. And uh, we have established uh, uh, working collaboration with most of them. The majority of uh, the salt, the large salt works now do routine biological management using atemia. But even more significantly, the practice has been introduced in the Tanga region of Tanzania by one of the salt works, the biggest salt farm called Kensalt, which is having interest in, uh, in salt farming in Tanzania as well. We have also in, uh, recruited and trained 25 artisanal farmers in Atemia pond production. We've created awareness and trained technicians, including some from the local communities and scientists in Atemia pond production and laviculture. Some of the scientists were trained in Ghent in, uh, with MSCs in aquaculture. We've also worked with a cross section of hatchery managers in the use of locally produced Atemia cysts and biomass. So locally, uh, locally produced Atemia is now sold to hatchery managers, though still in small quantities, but we have a very good opportunity to upscale. Next slide. So currently Atemia is actively produced in silks, artisanal salt farms, and one commercial farm. The artisanal farms average uh, 600, to 5,000 square meters with water depth of 30 to 40 centimeters. While the commercial farms uh, for commercial ponds range between two to five hectares and their water depth are between 50 to 70 centimeters. We are able to produce about 100 kilograms dry atemia cysts per season, but currently we don't harvest the biomass commercially we, the, the biomass harvested is only for research purposes. Now, the process that Timia, uh, since is sold at between uh, 70 to 140 US dollars, depending on the level of processing. 
and we estimate that uh, we can produce 38 kilogram of cis per hectare per season of six months. Now, we also have a modestly equipped Atemia laboratory in Kempfrey, and we have uh, acquired assist processing equipment. And even more importantly, uh, we have the policymakers who have taken notice. Next, please. So the challenges we face uh, include uh, the fact that we have very limited capacity and a legal framework to support aquaculture development uh, in general. The other thing uh, that is a little beyond our control is the current weather patterns. The weather patterns have become very erratic and unpredictable and oscillates from one extreme to another. So it's very difficult to plan production uh, for, for the atemia. And even salt production is sometimes affected. But there's a very huge problem we have, uh, particularly in the coastal region of Kenya with the land tenor system, which poses a big challenge for the small scale uh, producers. A lot of them do not have legal uh, claim to the land they use. And uh, for us, this is a challenge because the small scale farmers are the ones we are currently targeting uh, for, for, for faster uptake of, the, of, of, of Atemia uh, farming. Because there's very low uptake by the commercial farmers who for obvious reasons uh, feel that Atemia production is a waste of time because they make a lot of money from the, from the salt production. Now even more critical is the lack of funding for research and development from the public sector. The sector has been poorly funded uh, from the public sector. So that is a big challenge that needs to be solved. Next slide. So moving forward, uh, for us in Kenya, we really need to comprehensively address the land access issue in coastal Kenya not just for at the policy level, because it's, it's a, a, a problem that is not just affecting Atemia, but aquaculture development and economic empowerment of most of the common, uh, you know, the, 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 the indigenous and, uh, and, and uh, communities. It's mostly the large scale, the large scale uh, producers that, that have claimed to land. So this has to be solved at the, personal, uh, at the, at the policy level so that nobody is left behind. Then uh, it will be a very big win for us if uh, we have the large scale producers enter into commercial activity production and secure long term and, and secure long term funding for research and development. The good news is that uh, fortunately, Kenya's blue economy report has prioritized Atemia production for aquaculture development and employment creation. So I think this is a good place uh, for us to start to hold the policymakers uh, to account in order to fund the sector. So uh, I would like to say that it's really a privilege to, part of this, uh, to be a part of this consortium. And I believe we will have many opportunities to learn from one another and to move to the level we desire in Atemia corn production and aquaculture development in general, especially for those of us who came. Thank you so much for listening to me. So myself, is Ann Roman again. Now I will uh, briefly inform you about the Artemia production in Bangladesh. So the Artemia Franciscana Vietnam Bin Chao strain was first inoculated in Artemia farms on 31st March this year in Bangladesh. This has been initiated by EU funded Artemia for Bangladesh project led by Wallfish. The feasibility of the project, I said in my previous presentation, actually initiated in 2015 when Patrick came first time in Bangladesh. We went to the soil farms, we initiated the idea, and it took us a long time to an EU delegation or EU or convinced to funding such type of project. But at the end, we are successful. The field visit for to select Artemia Farm site was in collaboration with BISIC, Bangladesh Small Cottage and Industries Corporation, in 2020. You see the basic officials and also my colleagues visiting the site. The reason we select to working with the basic because they are the organization, government organization working with the salt farms. 
for last six years. So here are the font, uh, two Artemia fonts. I'd like to thank and acknowledge Poa uh, from Kanto University who helps us to design the layout of the Artemia fonts. Then uh, you see the photographs of the font construction with the canal, the soil pH, liming the pond, filtration to in, in introducing the water, and the salinity, wrecking the pond. The number of ponds, Artemia ponds this year, in this production year, I mean 2022, and, and since the rainy season starts 2021, is um, you see that uh, four sites. One is um, two farmers in, in a soil farm clusters. The another one is in Tekna, which is close to the Myanmar area. There we had three farmers. And then we had also collaborative demonstration farms with World Fish and Basic and one private company, Nidibili Limited, who have been as a business in agriculture, uh, in hatcheries, in the farms and things like that. So the number of ponds was 23 and there are fertilized ponds and artemia ponds. So in total, two fund about three hectare area, but we, not, we, we have been not successful everywhere. So in so, so in Kutsis Bazar, salt farmers, one farmer was successful in system biomass production. In Technap, two farmers are okay in biomass production. In BSIC, with, together with World Fish Demonstration, in three ponds, we are okay with Artemia system biomass production. In the com uh, private company, we are not successful because the place we selected has a problem with increasing the salinity because of the tidal and leakage and seepage. Then uh, here you can see that Artemia Franciscana being cow strain imported from Vietnam. And then the cyst measurement, cyst washing uh, as protocol developed long time before water preparation for hatching and also in star one Artemia has nuclei and the trust mode of transportation and the pond preparation before and then Artemia nuclei inoculation. Then the feed was for supplementary feeding fermented with a soya been thick male and also rice bran fermented with yeast for 24 hours supplementary feeding and also as fertilization here you see the first artemia seeds produced in bangladesh ever from artemia franciscana strain the way breaker used for the seeds to accumulate and here is more artemia seeds and the seed storage in saturated brine we have not processed like 10 or things like that yes because this is the first time we have been doing it here in bangladesh then here is biomass harvesting. One farmer was so far is very successful in biomass production. Till now, today, he almost sell about 40 kilo of Artemia biomass. Here is biomass packaging using the local transportation supply to the hatchery. Here is biomass ready for application in the hatchery. Here is the payment from the hatchery for the biomass. So what are the challenges? The, English, the, most, the challenges are proper size selection. You need to see that the, the with high tide and the cyclone, good water quality, soil pH, and access to the sites because you need to frequently visit the area. Preparation of optimum salinity within a short period of time because salinity to raise the optimum salinity for artemia takes quite some time because in the soil farm it takes slow, but when you have the depth and optimum water depth, it really takes take quite some time and artemia font as you know it has to be predator free and competitor free maintain algae concentration in artemia font in the right concentration is a challenge and then formation of pathogen free stress of artemia biomass okay we can think that it is a very high salinity but the consumer wants that it is the, the biomass or artemia is not carrying any pathogen to the hatcheries the hands-on training of the farmers uh, because we have been doing first time and the farmers has no knowledge, they have been never seen this Artemia culture. So we need to have trained the farmers and extension agents so a lot of farmers really can understand the Artemia culture techniques. And available of training and extension material in local language is no long, no a training and extension materials available. So we need to develop the training and extension material. Here, one farm we see that you see that there's a lot of vegetation around. We did we thought it is a nice location, but later, later on when we was planning to inoculate, we see that salinity control was really difficult because of the leakage surface. And then there are we also do inoculation. We found is that there is a coffee pot and and the roti farts is a predator and competitor. So what are the long term challenges? The the soil farms, as you heard, that there are thousands of soil farms. 
are involving and there are marginalized least farmers small scale farmers so organize thousands of small scale farmers and then for sustainable extension su extension service for for these small scale farmers available credit and making profitable for them is a really challenge the laboratory service for the quality assurance of the cyst and biomass because when people wants to buy they like to see it is pathogen free it is a good nutrition it is not contaminated things that are for the laboratory support this is lack here in bangladesh develop market linkages linkages because soil farm soil farming is quite remote areas so on those areas how can you make the uh, market link is when you have the biomass you want to sell it live and things like that and also we even it is in cox bazar there are islands not really have the good road construct on communication to to the uh, consumers like hatcheries and the processing of artemia cyst and biomass if we promote to thousands and thousands of farmers if you start doing artemia cyst biomass then it really has to be in industrial scale we are not ready for that i think this is going to be a long term challenge so what is our plan for the future years so we would like to of course increase small scale marginalized artemia and soil farmers area of increase area of production amount of cyst and biomass production per unit area we like to involve stakeholders like department of fisheries bangladesh fisheries research institute soil bangladesh soil small uh, soil and uh, industries corporation universities non government organizations farmer organizations shrimp and fish fisheries and also ensure women participation as a gender integration artemia cyst and biomass processing preservation packaging and market as a product ready product the another challenge a uh, plan for the future is the new development of art artemia biomass used in aquaculture for example freshwater fish species the lapia or others and also it could be an as an ingredient in human food concerning concerning is high nutritious value so i would like to acknowledge professor patrick sorglos for his initiation and idea on supporting this project from right from the beginning Uh, EU delegation, Mr. Manfred, who supported the project to be funding, and Mr. Dario, who is the contact person for the EU delegation, our World Fish Country Director, who has been supporting the all this, but not least, but not least, it is Artemia Farmers of Bangladesh who have been supporting this project right to to do this for this for completely new initiation for them. Thank you very much. Okay, good. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today is my great honor that I have chance to present on the workshop, and I will talk about the first trial of Artemia culture in Cambodia in 2016 and 17. Next slide, please. You can see about the our map of Cambodia. So we have four provinces which border to the coastal line. Kokong, Prasai Anu Province, Kampot Province, and Kaya Province, and we also have a, a close to economic zone about 200 meter mile from the baseline. So actually, we also have the big potential of uh, for Artemia seed production and also biomass because we have uh, uh, 4,500 hectare which used for the soil. And according to geographic and climate, it's not so far from Vietnam and Thailand. So that's why we, uh, Professor Patrick, uh, would like us to try all on uh, Artemia seed production. Next, please. Sir. So, can you back to previous slide, sir? Yes. Uh, on November 2014, Professor Patrick and visit a soil farm in Kampot and Cap to verify the potential and possibility. Of uh, artemia seed production, as you may see in the slide presentation. So, under supported by EU project, so two officer from this administration and one soil producer was inspired to attend the training. The whole process of artemia seed production and uh, biomass production at solar solar in Winchow Station, Kantar uh, University. We also include some uh, participants from Myanmar, like uh, four participants as well at the same at the, at the time. And under supported by EU, we also start uh, our seed, uh, uh, seed production in solar in 2016 in Kampot Province, and we got full support, technical support from Dr. Mu Yen Huawa, 
and from Kanto University. And at the same time, he also introduced us to use the uh, wind chill uh, strand uh, we call the Admiral Sessio to stock in our uh, uh, culture system. Mr. Mr. Please. So we are talking about the size selection. So please move to another. <coughs> so as you may see in this slide, presentation about uh, less than one hectare area that we use for our trial which located in Comport province move to the next please yeah. so is the the uh, team culture system that we designed by uh, dr wa so you can see so we have a uh, three uh team culture pond and two fertilization pond so if you can see here if we the main source of the salt water come from the canal and then we pump to the low salinity reservoir and then we pass many mini steps at the evaporator pond to get a high salinity. Here is the deck uh, at the pond design. So our uh, pond, the, our deck is one uh, meter and we have slope and the ditch around the pond about 0 0.3 uh, meter. So let me uh, show you about the result that we obtained from two cycles in 2016 and 2017. Uh, so you can see about the temperature. So both of uh, dry oil is under the optimum condition for atimia. For salinity also, we also have some problem in, like sometimes uh, salinity uh, uh, decreased be below 8, 80 ppt. And turbidity is a big problem that we challenge. So suppose we, we, we would like to maintain our turbidity at uh, 25 to 30 uh, millimeter, mean that so we can provide them the uh, enough food for atimia. But in our case, uh, we cannot produce uh, the high density of the micro RT. So that's why we cannot uh, fit micro RT in the uh, atimia culture pond uh, to maintain uh, 25 and 30 uh, centimeter and for diesel oxygen also no, no problem so it's still under the optimum condition as you may see in the slide presentation here is the density just comparing the uh, the density or, or we can say the survival rate of uh, atimia uh, in 2016 and 2017 and you can see in the slide so in 2017 so the survival rate of atimia are uh, higher than 2016 and the next uh, the next slide will uh, explain you what is the reason why as well and it's the growth of the uh timir in total length so uh for the first trial uh 2016 timir seem grow uh, very slow comparing uh 2017 uh, so from week one week two and week three here is the efficacy that we also check uh, during our trial to so count the uh, how many uh, uh, seeds that uh, contain in the brood. So in 2017, so we have uh, a lot of uh, 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 seeds inside the, the brood of the of the mother, and it's a number of the seeds that we collect by week uh, between 2016 and 17. Uh, so you can see so. Uh, during the first trial, we get, get only six uh, kilogram per hectare, but uh, 2017 we get uh, like uh, 84 kilogram. So in 2017, we get high more, uh, productivity comparing to the 2016, and I will uh, explain you why uh, it become like that. Uh, this is this is the reason why that uh, our production low in 2016. So first is about the weather, weather. So sometimes rain is coming, so unexpected rain coming, and another one about the no nutrition of the supplement uh, supplementary feed. Uh, because at the time we just use only rye bran, this plus vitamin, maybe something like that. And if we're talking about the uh, micro algae, so we cannot produce and step ball the production because like as I list uh, some uh, uh, reason why like uh, sometimes also lab lab uh, appear in inside the bottom of the uh, fertilization pond and sometimes it's cont contamination of the other of uh, zooplankton and we still consider about the uh, NP ratio of the nutrition and 
for the low uh, water, uh, sorry, the low uh, nutrition of the water that we introduce into uh, into uh, uh, fertilization pond. So in 2017, so we just modify uh, like you can see here. So first we reformulate the supplementary food by adding uh, fish meal and beverages into the supplementary food. And also we modify the pond bottom of the uh, fertilization pond by making deeper to minimize lab lab. And also we conduct uh, experiment on different NP ratio on 30 ppp uh, salinity water and also same with the NP ratio at the 60 uh, ppt. But we even we try like this, but we cannot get uh, any uh, to increase the the production. So only reformulate. We just uh, use the re reformulate uh, supplementary feed to to increase the the production of the atinia yeast. Oh, sorry, atinesis in 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 our country. So I just want to show you about the. Uh, Cash flow of the of the production, so you can see here. So, uh, for in, in initial, we just use about like one thousand two hundred something to uh, uh, initial investment, and we also can produce about uh, one kilogram of this. And then we, this is like sorry, I I forgot to come to in US dollar about uh two two hundred thousand mean like fifty US dollar per kilo. So we get about uh, 5,000 US dollar per year. And then if, when we minus about the cost, so just uh, like uh, about uh, 2,000 US dollar remain per year, something like that. That's, that's all for me. If you have any questions, please. Okay, thank you very much. Now the presenter is uh, Mr. Uso Chun from uh, Myanmar. Uh, Mr. Uso Chun, please. Uh, couple of seconds let me to share your presentation to the all, all participants yeah uh, we, uh, i'm so soon from Myanmar. in our work we started uh, in 2014 and then we have two full members two are from the shrimp farm uh, salt farmers and we try to increase their income and then the other one dr Mew, who is from the university of pate and then i am from uh, senior vice president from the Myanmar fisheries federation and I'd like to share, and my name is Soton, and I'm going to present the paper. The first two is, first one, Dr. Ong Jozo is a medical doctor, but he got a, a soft farm and he's operating for a long time, and Wu Teng also soft farm. Dr. Biu is an associate, associate professor of the Mid University. I would like to share in this three that the salt condition, the shrimp industry condition of Myanmar. In our area, in the Deltaric area, there is around 20,000 hectares, the largest area of salt farming area. Moon State around 2000 and, and, and 2500 and kind states. And uh, uh, this area, the, 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 uh, there was a cyclone in 2008 and then this salt area also was just devastated. And then the, for the shrimp farming, we got 100,000 hectares of fish farm and also 98,000 shrimp farm. But after this Nagas uh, hit the area in Erawadi, which is a big area, we have to import a little bit of salt from uh, Vietnam and a lot from the, uh, uh, Thailand, and uh, where the quality is much better, and then the salt quality, the price went so far low, so they are in a, in a problem now. Yeah, uh, so I'd just like to give you a little bit big background of, so we are exporting about uh, 700 million uh, well, for our seafood export is 700 million US dollar per, an, per annually, but we are far behind in the neighboring countries. And now we are uh, we we look for expansion, and we found that the expansion can be in the aquaculture area. So when we have a salt farming area about 100,000, these are all uh, pertain to the freshwater carp production. And then the marine area is uh, is very also very. Marine shrimp farming is also a large area. The largest area is in the Rakhine State, which is in a in a southwestern area of Myanmar, and is around one one hundred fifty six thousand acres. And this area is very productive before, but due to the the political condition of our country, it, uh, the area is now 
mostly abandoned now. So the reason, other reason is that the uh, aquaculture cannot uh, jump start because of the seed problem. So the ship seed, uh, freshwater sea bass are all very scarce. And, and around in 1970, there was there was a good production, but later on there was some surge of diseases, and then the the, the shortage of seed were to be then. So uh, so there, there comes uh, we have a project with, which you call a BTSF project from EU, and this EU uh, delegate come to promote our uh, seafood industry. So we I'm from the Myanmar uh, uh, Fisheries Federation, and we try to. Uh, to to inform our and request the EU uh, the, the authorities that we have only seven hatcheries for marine and 27 hatcheries for, for freshwater prawn hatcheries. And they are all 70% is now not, are not in production because of the shortage of Artemia. And we have only two, two dealers selling uh, Artemia now in Myanmar. So sometimes we are short of supply. So when we ask about the request to the EU, EU sent oh, two well-known well -known, uh, ex but a consultant from uh, one from Dr. Patrick, who is chairing the, this section now, and also Dr. Uh, Nguyen Van Hoa from Canton University, they come to uh, help us and do the survey. So the EU come in the two sections. First, in 2014, the EU expert want to survey the area, and then uh, Dr. Patrick and Dr. Hoa like to survey both the area, the eastern part of Myanmar and the western part of Myanmar. And I was the guy who tried to show them all this area, and they chose the two area in the western part, uh, west, west southern part, uh, called the, uh, the Jagan area and also in Panga. So we try to do, they want to do the trial and they, uh, in the meantime, they, 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 they like the, uh, make, make some workshop. And then uh, when we did the, the, the thing, uh, there, there was some workshop and Dr. Patrick explained about some of our inoculations that failed, why we failed, he explained about that. And because of this uh, good, good uh, the tutoring and explanation from both the consultant, the expert, and uh, after showing the Ademir production of Vietnam, the people of uh, the salt farm from Chaga and Panga agreed to do the, the trial. So that's how we started. So there is uh, Ademir, it's an obligate cassation and many species of in the hatchery we need for fish, crab, shrimp, and culture. And, and then the, to, the, this area of Ademir, we have some difficulties getting because we have to import a lot from, from outside the country. from especially from America and others. So we cannot spend much uh, cash on the, so the, the hatcheries area in Myanmar is not very developed. So we learned that the demand for the, total demand for the world is around 22,000, but we can only uh, produce about 400,000 tons locally. So, so I'll just give you a Artemia Pond culture for the, the background of it. When we start in the, we start in around 220, uh, uh, 1980, 18, because, uh, uh, when I was working as a, a as a technician in the Pearl and Fisheries Corporation, we tried to to connect to the the government salt farm, which is Tambinjau area in Mohrin area, and, and try to connect uh, Dr. Patrick from the Gandhi University. At that time, there's no email. We have to convey by the you know uh, to get the support and he support me with the literature and all the technique and all. And I and I reported that in my MSc thesis in 1981. And then later on, there was some further inauguration from the University of Malmi and also from the salt industry itself, the government tried to do some. Some are successful, some are not successful. Later we found out why it is when Dr. Patrick came. And one of the other workers in this area is uh, Mimi Wu, who is doing a thesis on some aspect of the development stages. So uh, several biomass culture was done by Dr. Mimi Wu from the University of uh, Pateng University he have done after 1985. So some trial of salt was also the survey of Dr. Dr. Patrick and Dr. Hoa came in 2014, and after that, the aim is to have the the the, the income generation, more income generation for the soil farmers, which are now very very low. And the objective is to go and then to how to learn from the Artemia uh, in training in the in the Kanto uh, the Benchao area. So we we the two experts check the Myanmar weather, and they check that there's a, a, a in the coast dry season is around the temperatures around 20 to 24 and in the hot season it went up to 30 to 35. The salinity, the area that we chose is uh, it range between 20, 20 to 35 ppg. So in October from to May, so we can start that. But rainfall also is a cumbersome. Sometimes it, when we start of the onset of rainy season, monsoon, it, the, the rain come in torrent. That sometimes we, that's why we don't have much such. So, so this is the Artemia design that 
the two expert design and we do it in the this is in the Panga area and the Jaga area. So this is the two area. We're very far eastern area and the southwestern area. This is a, so the pond management, we do the, the salt production according to the Nugget salt area. We filter the water and then we get the starter, the inoculation starter from Wen Chao, and we try to inoculate around 100 to 150 nopia per liter. And then we fertilize the pond first and around we started with the 50 to 60 ppd water and then we try to start with the uh, 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 chicken manure first and later with a, a dose of uh, inorganic fertilizer so uh, the, the, when we have the green water we try to pump the green water every two to three days and then we try to maintain the water so that the the salinity will not go less than 80 ppd and then uh, we try to uh, top up around 15 percent of the yeah it's not the case so um, let me then uh, continue. So this was uh, uh, a project where at two sites uh, we um, were um, setting up a demonstration. Uh, the conditions were uh, favorable. Uh, we had a problem at a certain moment that the rainy season came earlier than expected. Uh, a bit the same that we have heard from other speakers with uh, climate change. Cysts have been analyzed uh, and um, are of uh, the typical uh, small sized Franciscana, similar to the uh, Vinchao. And uh, um, as we can read there, uh, a project through the University of Arizona so with support of USAID has also done some testing in using these artemia in uh, mud crab uh, hatchery. So uh, I mentioned that already before, the Aquarium Association of Myanmar is interested in buying Artemia, uh, uh, mainly uh, the Artemia biomass. Uh, very interesting because I have seen it also in some other presentations, uh, quite new for uh, Myanmar, but uh, this is a practice that is very popular in Thailand and in Vietnam. and. Uh, some of the participants here might be interested to hear hatchery owners who like to buy saline water of, and I add here maximum 150 ppt for using their hatcheries from the salt farms. So with one cubic meter of 150 ppt plus four cubic meters of good quality fresh water, you make up five cubic meters of perfect seawater for use in hatchery. Um, and uh, there is uh, further EU fund EU funding with an ongoing project uh, called MySAP. A few uh, pictures here on um, the um, collecting, screening, washing, and um, brine separation. Next. Uh, this is the, uh, um, uh, when you see the former capital city, Yangon, it's to the south uh, left where you see that yellow dot this is where uh, uh, we had uh, a lot of damage a uh, number of years ago through the Nargis storm. You see some pictures to the right of the damage that was made. And uh, a lot of the salt farms there uh, have a difficult time to get back into production. And uh, some pictures here with uh, people from um, uh, the EU who was involved. And um, the picture to the top left, some of you might... Um, recognize um, uh, Will, Bill Williams from uh, Auburn University uh, who also had uh, who also was involved in the USAID project. Some further views on uh, the processing facilities, raking of the ponds, uh, the coronal systems for freshwater uh, um, cleaning and then you see in the middle uh, at the bottom, the air drying, so uh, first equipment uh, that was uh, imported from Vietnam for the cyst processing. The use of Artemia biomass, freezing and transport, and you see use in ornamental, mud crab, and uh, also macrobrachio. This can be consulted later, some uh, indications on uh, how much income um, can be generated. You see about uh, 8,000 US dollars for a 20 hectare area only salt production, whereas when, when it is combined with Artemia, it can uh, be um, uh, four times higher, up to 29,000 uh, US dollars. The next presenter is from uh, Malaysia, 
Yong Iksung. Uh, a very good evening to everyone. My name is uh, Yong Iksung, but all my good friends call me Sunny. Uh, I'm currently a professor and director at the Institute of Marine Biotechnology uh, in a university situated at the east coast of Peninsula Malaysia called University Malaysia Trengganu. Uh, first of all, Mizan, thank you very much for inviting me to give a talk today. And uh, well, after listening to all uh, the previous presentation, I suddenly felt so little and small now uh, when I compare the scale of production or the activity of Artemia culture in Malaysia compared to our uh, neighboring countries. But uh, nevertheless, I'm going to uh, share with everyone today that uh, what initiatives that we have uh, proposed and uh, ongoing in Malaysia in terms of uh, Artemia culture, particularly on Artemia biomass culture, but uh, in a very small scale that we are starting now. Now, uh, for your information, Malaysia does not have natural Artemia habitat. And this is very unfortunate because uh, uh, we could not produce cysts um, uh, in our country. And uh, while in fact, um, we do not have a very systematic documentation of Artemia culture activities in Malaysia, but uh, after consulting with uh, several senior people, uh, farmers in Malaysia, that we do have some that uh, started a very small scale in the 1990s. And this is in line with the bloom of the ornamental fish culture in Malaysia. And for your information, Malaysia is one of the biggest uh, uh, ornamental fish culture in the world, therefore requiring a lot of uh, high quality live feed to support um, the culture of high quality or high value uh, ornamental fish uh, in, in, in the market uh, right now. Now, one of the biggest problem, uh, why Artemia culture does not expand for so many years in, uh, in Artemia, uh, in, in Malaysia is that uh, well, when I consulted them, uh, many of the farmers told me that they are not keen to culture microalgae first. Because if they were to culture the microalgae utilizing the costs and also the, 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 the facilities and also uh, all those uh, hassle that is in microalgae culture, then um, they might not be interested anymore in uh, culturing Artemia. Because as you know, Artemia biomass uh, serves as very good food uh, for ornamental fish. But as you know, ornamental fish farms, usually they are small and they do not have big space uh, to culture microalgae and the hassle that brings uh, together with Artemia culture. So um, one of the other factors will be labor cost is quite expensive as well as utility costs over here. And uh, well, with that, uh, a lot of uh, farmers they switch over to rotifers, moina or daphnia, or even uh, they do not have uh, options. And what they did was they buy in uh, frozen artemia from uh, our neighboring countries. But uh, at the same time, uh, they do face a lot of problem about the quality of artemia biomass in frozen forms uh, upon feeding to the ornamental uh, fish that they have. So uh, after I came back uh, from Gantry University, uh, back to Malaysia, I have engaged a lot of uh, talks with uh, local farmers, especially those with uh, ornamental fish producers, where um, uh, slowly I understand what is their thought and how do we, uh, um, how do we counter the problems that they have. So. Uh, one of the idea is if you, we want our farmers to produce uh, artemia, the first thing that we need to do is to make a readily food for them to culture artemia without the use of microalgae. And then only they would be interested in uh, culturing artemia in, in Malaysia. So uh, uh, very luckily within uh, almost uh, five to six years, we managed to uh, formulate uh, a type of feed, uh, very cheap, in fact, 
and uh, the source is from uh, the palm kernel expeller that uh, uh, our country used to produce palm oil. And uh, from that, uh, this is a very cheap agricultural byproduct. And for your information, I'm not going to dwell into the composition of this uh, feed, but uh, the cost of uh, producing one kilogram of Artemia biomass production, we need to utilize about five kilograms of raw palm kernel expeller that would cost approximately uh, 1.5 uh, US dollar, which is approximately five ringgit uh, Malaysia. Um, well, after uh, three to four years uh, of a lot of engagement, uh, we slowly convinced farmers around Malaysia, of course, uh, not big farms, but uh, ornamental fish uh, farmers to start their own Artemia biomass culture to support first their own uh, industry, all right? Because a lot of farmers came to me and they do have some complaints about imported Artemia uh, biomass versus the live ones that they produce and fed instantly to those uh, ornamental fish. So uh, there are basically a few centers uh, right now in Malaysia that produces uh, Artemia biomass with the technology that we transfer to them, uh, making the food for Artemia as well as raising them uh, with the available system that uh, we taught them. Now, uh, in, at UNT, we have uh, uh, produced some of the Artemia that is used for supporting seahorse culture. We have uh, quite a big uh, projects on uh, seahorse production as, an, uh, as well as uh, in ornamental fish uh, production. And uh, this is one of the production uh, center uh, uh, in uh, Negri Sembilan. And uh, the purpose of the Artemia biomass production is to feed uh, high value ornamental fish such as arowana here. So as you know that uh, a piece of arowana uh, costs uh, about uh, 300 to 400 uh, US and that is the main reason why they require high quality food such as live uh, Artemia. And this is another uh, center which we have transferred technology and he is a breeder of uh, discus fish and also autumn angel. And if you see a piece of discus and a piece of autumn angel may cost approximately 100 US dollar. So, uh, in fact, uh, those farmers that produce Artemia, they are willing to invest in, in Artemia biomass production because the, the return is quite high. Now, this is a very important slide which I would like to share with you, uh, is the, the, the production scale that uh, we have proposed for, for the farmers. In fact, uh, still small scale, and uh, we propose them to have a 14 tank system. And, uh, well, and each of the month, they can produce twice, uh, two cycles, and uh, total production is only 24 kilo per month. This is a very, very uh, small scale if we compare to uh, what has been presented. But the production costs, because some are inlands, so they use salt to make uh, seawater, therefore the costs increase significantly, but if we use seawater, the production cost of producing one kilogram of Artemia biomass is approximately at three US dollar. Now, um, what is very important here, and I think it is very attractive for, to all of you, is that the live biomass uh, of Artemia in Malaysia could be sold at approximately plus minus US $25 per kilo. And we are talking about live uh, biomass. So this is a price and is considered quite high uh, when we compare to other uh, neighboring countries. So uh, this is the system where we, we uh, propose to, that, to, uh, to them, stagnant system, batch culture, uh, and because Artemia only takes approximately 14 days to grow into adults, so two cycles per month and one kilogram of biomass per tank, and they can harvest every day. Now, uh, what 
uh, how is the growth of artemia fed with the, the feed? And if you see here, we compare several types of cysts and brands and so forth. You see that uh, all of those brands and uh, artemia cysts or, or what we call the species, they can reach approximately uh, 1 cm at, uh, on the day 14 uh, upon culture. Okay, and these are the comparison of uh, the, the, the feed that goes into the gut of uh, Artemia. So I'm not going to go very detailed about it. Nutritionally, they are almost the same when we, we feed them with uh, Corella. Now, what are the main challenges that uh, Malaysia is facing now? Malaysia is way behind in Artemia culture. I have to admit that uh, if you... Uh, know very well my age that there is a band called New Kids on the Block. So we are the new kids on the block. And of course, certainly we need a lot of help from our neighboring countries uh, who are already very successful in Artemia uh, culture. And of course, uh, when we talk about frozen Artemia, those that comes or imported from our neighboring countries is definitely cheaper than the ones that we produce in our country. But that is why uh, uh, after uh, discussing with a lot of experts that we cannot cut and paste what other countries uh, is doing right now. And we have to modify those products that we, have, uh, we, we produce later on. Um, still, the usage of Artemia is quite limited in the country, uh, mainly for local ornamental fish farms and also for shrimp farms. And of course, uh, one of the major challenges will, would be uh, high labor and utility costs. And uh, at the moment, only for high value species. Um, just to share a bit of uh, the recently, or I would say uh, approved project that was uh, given quite a, a big funding by the university. Uh, it's called uh, Translational Research where the initiative, this initiative is to boost uh, the Artemia culture and production facilities and centers in Malaysia, where we can help to support the development of our aquaculture industry in the country without depending a lot uh, on imported uh, product. And uh, we would uh, look into the aspect of uh, live and frozen Artemia Vibrio-free and enriched Artemia, and uh, part of this uh, uh, framework is transfer the knowledge that we have on Artemia culture to the community and uh, create entrepreneurship opportunities and also hopefully with the appropriate framework that we can generate more income for our community. Now this... Uh, uh, UMT is currently uh, de developing these Artemia production facilities, uh, which uh, house uh, culture facilities, uh, food preparation facilities, uh, packaging, and uh, in fact, we do have, uh, 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 we, we are establishing a, a relatively uh, good QC lab and also packaging facilities later on where uh, we would do it as a pet um, uh, models of uh, packing using blister packaging and so forth. So with the construction of the hatchery, uh, we also include, and this I need to thank to uh, Dr. Hua from Kanto University because he has uh, also given us uh, input in the beginning of the uh, discussion of the project. And I'm very sorry that uh, the pandemic has slowed and delayed uh, the, the, the running of the project, but thanks to Dr. Hua that uh, uh, he came to UMT and gave a lot of uh, his input as well as uh, Professor Patrick Sogolos uh, that tank production could be also uh, to look into uh, Artemia cyst production in tanks. So uh, we are looking to set up uh, some very small pilot scale uh, uh, tank for cis production uh, at UMT and to do a lot of R&D on this expect first. So upon the construction of this hatchery, we anticipate that approximately 600 to 1,000 kilograms of live biomass 
could be produced from the facilities. And uh, I see that as an opportunity because uh, shrimp culture or what we call the panic shrimp rootstock um, culture is also expanding in Malaysia. And therefore I see the potential of uh, bringing this live biomass, uh, Artemia biomass into the industry uh, as well as to the ornamental fish uh, farms that we have uh, throughout uh, Malaysia. So uh, this is some of the photos of the UMT Artemia hatchery construction, which is still in uh, progress. And you see that we, we covered a big area uh, that we, we, we would uh, be able to uh, sustain later on the production of the value that I have presented to you uh, just now. So with that, uh, a bit of uh, uh, information from Malaysia, and uh, particularly, I'd like to thank uh, Patrick uh, for the support uh, uh, throughout the project. And of course, to Li Ying, the next presenter, uh, thank you for testing out uh, the artificial food that uh, were brought to China and tested in China. And I'm very... Uh, happy that uh, to receive the response from Li Ying that the feed uh, works in the lab, in her lab as well. So this is very good news. Uh, to Dr. Hua, thank you very much. And certainly I would like uh, to invite you back when the pandemic is over and to continue uh, giving your valuable input in our project. Uh, to Raymond, uh, my very good friend, and he was the past president of the Ornamental Fish Culture Society in Malaysia that uh, truly supports uh, uh, later on um, the utilization of Artemia biomass and also exports, the potential export that we can go through uh, Singapore later on. And last but not least, I'd like to thank a lot to uh, my postgrad students who they are also the uh, hatchery managers, Artemia hatchery managers uh, in our university, uh, Mida and Priya. With that, thank you very much, Mizan. So, I guess you would like to present by yourself, slide sharing, that's okay from my side. So, please go ahead. So, uh, very good evening, everyone. Um, so, my name is uh, Sui Li Ying. I'm the professor from Tianjin University of Science and Technology. And my uh, university uh, is located uh, on the Bohai Bay coastal region uh, of China. Uh, I'm also the director of Asian Regional Artemia Reference Center. This center is um, uh, was established in, in 2016 uh, in collaboration with Food uh, 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 FAO of the United Nations. Um, so I'm the last speaker of this uh, workshop. I will try to make my presentation shorter. But first of all, I uh, would like to thank Ms. Anouk, Patrick, and all the participants um, to provide such a good opportunity for us to um, exchange the information and sharing the experience on the uh, Artemia pond production. Um, here, I would like to report the Artemia pond, the, the history and the current situation of Artemia pond production, um, particularly in Bohai Bay coast region of China. Um, China is rich in Artemia biodiversity and resources. Um, Artemia sinica, Artemia uh, tibetiana are the two indigenous um, Artemia species. Well, parthenogenetic populations are uh, also existed in the salt works and uh, also inland salt lakes. Since early 1990s, the um, uh, Artemia francis kana has uh, been existed in the Bohai Bay salt works as the result of uh, artificial inoculation of Artemia cysts from the San Francisco Bay, the US. Uh, most of the Artemia pond production uh, has occurred in Bohai Bay coastal uh, region, as you can see here, where the salt production is operated from thousands of hectares uh, salt ponds. The Bohai Bay region is the major sea salt production region in China. It has uh, 
40 million tons of salt production each year. Uh, the figure uh, comes from uh, came from uh, 2015, and uh, the salt pro uh, were produced from about uh, 250,000 hectares of salt ponds. So, um, talking about the history of the Atimia pond production, the development of uh, the production can be divide, uh, the, divided into three uh, stages. So, the decades of uh, 1980 to 1990, I think it, it can be considered as the starting up of the commercialization of the wild resources. Before 1980s, the harvest of the Artemia cysts as well as the biomass were usually used as a supplemental feed for the local chicken farm. Uh, feeding of Artemia biomass and also the cysts uh, always resulted in the bright or uh, orange color of the uh, egg yolks. So uh, the farmers like to feed uh, those uh, Artemia biomass to their chicken. The commercialization of Artemia resources uh, in China started from 1980s along the faster development of the marine shrimp, Penate sinensis, and also the Chinese mitten crab, Irohir sinensis, larvae culture. Um, the Bohai Bay Artemia cysts is known uh, as a better hatchability and also higher nutritional value, especially for the high EPA content. And it, it also has a reasonable cyst diameters and the, the diapos of the cyst uh, are also easier to be uh, terminated for the Bohai Bay cysts. So it's it is the highly demanded cyst products in the market, and usually the price of bohai bay cysts is double than the cysts that uh, produced from the other inland salt lakes. Um, nevertheless, the yield and the quality of the Artemia products are unstable uh, in that period. So then, the pond production, in fact, was really initiated in the decades of 1990s to 2000s. In early 1990s, closer biological management of the salt ponds was proposed through the uh, support uh, from Ghent University uh, with a successful introduction of Artemia franciscana uh, in the Bohai Bay salt ponds. Um, so at the end of the century, Due to the fast development of aquaculture and also the shortage of the sister supply worldwide, the extensive Artemia pond production received a lot of attention. Uh, large areas of salt lands were used to construct the ponds for Artemia pond production in Bohai Bay uh, coastal region. The size of the ponds varied from several hundred square meters to 100 hectare, so very um, big difference. And also the cyst yield uh, reached about three to 60 kilo white weight per hectare. It's also uh, varied a lot. Um, because uh, the Bohai Bay region has the temperate continental climate. So the Artemia production generally in this area starts in May, um, when the temperature has reached, uh, has increased to above 15 centigrade degree, and it ends to the end of the November when the water temperature drops to uh, less than 10 degree. So in construct to the monsoon climate in the Southeast Asia, TML biomass and assists are mostly produced in an extensive way in the Bohai Bay region in that uh, period, uh, no organic menu or agricultural byproducts were added to the ponds as a supplemental feed. And uh, unfortunately, the uh, very low uh, uh, cyst production and uh, uh, were obtained and uh, also less benefit, benefit 
uh, from the pump pro production were obtained in that period. So from then on, the pond production was not very much concerned in Bohai Bay region. However, meantime, the cyst production dropped dramatically in this in the Bohai Bay Solar Salt Works from 800 to, to uh, 1,000 ton per year, reduced to 300 to 400 ton per year since the uh, year of 2000. And the reason for that is to is the reduction of the uh, in the overall size of the salt production area, the over harvesting of Artemia biomass and assists, and also extensive discharge of effluents from desalination plants and the bromine extraction plants into a very low uh, salinity environment, uh, environment uh, evaporation ponds. And so since 2010, the interest in Artemia pond production has risen again, aiming to produce high quality uh, Bohai Bay Artemia seeds, as well as the Artemia biomass. This led to um, involvement of a number of salt uh, work managers in semi-intensive uh, pond culture. That means uh, we, uh, the, the farmers uh, did stock enhancement through the Artemia inoculation, and also they did um, the, the supplementation uh, of uh, the chicken menu uh, in the ponds to stimulate algal blooms in the ponds. And uh, now uh, for the last two slides, I would like to share you uh, some information about the Artemia biomass production in Bohai Bay coastal region. Nowadays, there are a huge amount of Artemia biomass are harvested annually from the Bohai Bay coast uh, salt, work, uh, salt ponds. About uh, average uh, is about 100,000 uh, tons. Sorry, I didn't put the unit. Uh, most of them are harvested from the Bohai Bay coast salt ponds, but also a few of them, a little of them, are uh, harvested from the inland salt lakes in Xinjiang province, in Tibet, in Inner Mongolia, and in Shanxi province. Uh, there are two types of pond production in Bohai Bay coastal region. So the semi-intensive management, uh, the total area is over 3,000 hectares. And this, um, the semi-intensive uh, Artemia pond culture uh, are performed in the construct, uh, constructed ponds. And also, we have also extensive management in the uh, evaporation pond of salt works uh, with the area of over uh, 13,000 hectares. The harvested Artemia biomass are processed in forms of frozen biomass cakes, which uh, are counting, accounts for about 55% of the total production, uh, and also fresh biomass, uh, 45 of total production, uh, and also a very small amount of air dried biomass. This uh, is mainly produced in the inland provinces. Um, so the annual yield of the frozen biomass is about 65 to 70,000 tons in period of April to uh, October, mostly in the middle of May to middle of September. Uh, more than 80 of the products are produced from the Bohai Bay salt ponds um, by around 20 to 30 producers. The frozen biomass are sold as feed in aquarium as a small blister and also to sold to the shrimp nurseries and the broodstock maturation in a, a bigger cakes, uh, one to two uh, kilogram cakes, as well as as a formulated feed ingredients. There, uh, they produce bigger cakes, uh, about five uh, kg. And also, not only the frozen biomass, but also the fresh biomass uh, are collected and delivered immediately to the neighboring uh, shrimp nursery and shrimp farms, except for the shrimp, Little Panis Venomae, the wet-like shrimp, the 
Artemia biomass, the frozen one and also the fresh one, are also fit to the Chinese mitten crab Eurhea sinensis, uh, several marine uh, species, uh, fish species, the, 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 uh, solias, um, the solia and also the, the uh, groupers, and also jellyfish and ornamental fishes. So then there are still some issues uh, needs to be concerned on the Artemia pond production in China. Although we have a huge uh, Artemia, uh, say the biomass and also the sister production um, in China, in Bohai Bay area, but there's still a lack of proper management, which results in unstable and unpredictable Artemia uh, production. We need to uh, study the e ecological characteristics of the ponds and the dynamics of the Artemia populations over the production cycles. And also uh, the suitable techniques adapted to the local conditions, for example, the fertilization regimes still need to be developed. So we need to uh, evolve more, um, I mean, the research and also the the practical uh, work uh, to the pond production. And also more important, I put it in the red color here, is the biosafety, not only, uh, only for the salt production, but also more important to the aqu aquaculture production. Uh, I think in this uh, point of view, the processing procedure and the product quality should be standardized. And thanks uh, to the Ministry of uh, Agriculture and the Rural Affairs of China, uh, they have made the budget this year to support us, ARARC, the Asian Regional Artemia Reference Center, to make the aquaculture industry, industry uh, industrial standard for the frozen biomass. So this will be uh, good for um, the production of uh, frozen Artemia biomass in the future. Of course, more collaborations between the North and South and South and the South should be conducted in the future and more attention from the international organizations should also be given to this uh, very uh, uh, prospective Artemia pond production uh, in China and also uh, in the other places uh, around the world. Thank you very much. But uh, just give me a, a few uh, seconds before I finish my um, presentation. I would like to show you 30 seconds, the uh, short video clips uh, about the Artemia processing uh, in Bohai Bay area. This is the frozen, already the frozen one uh, coming out from the uh, freezer. Now it's the, they also cook the frozen cake with the ice to protect the artemia, to keep it in the good quality. So that's all for my uh, presentation. Thank you very much for your uh, listening. Thank you. Thanks, Suling. So now I hand over to Pat to lead the question and answer session discussion recommendation. Patrick, floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I think we are all a little bit uh, overwhelmed with uh, the um, information and uh, the presentations. I have noted a lot of questions here, but I'm wondering, uh, I think uh, a number of you after um, uh, four hours in this workshop that you might get tired. Um, maybe a couple of items that I want to uh, address and um, I will immediately um, link with what uh, uh, Su Ying was mentioning about biosecurity. Uh, this is indeed something where um, uh, there is a lot of um, uh, claims that are made that are not well justified. So uh, uh, many people uh, um, were importing Artemia biomass from China uh, all the way up to Ecuador because it is well documented that Artemia biomass is an excellent shrimp maturation diet. And then suddenly people uh, started to be suspicious. Ah, maybe this Artemia biomass 
comes from an area where there is shrimp farming, so there might be contamination. So I don't know, Pam, are you um, still there? Um, maybe you could briefly explain about the Bonchong farm, who for more than 20 years is uh, uh, producing their own Artemia biomass uh, for Monodon. Pam, you were there? Maybe. Yes, yeah. uh, Professor, I would like to pass this uh, to Mr. Tanan because he's yeah. also here. Yeah, oh, yes. Yes, Tanan, you, you have the floor. Hello? Yes, we hear you. Okay, okay. Uh, question, question. Well, um, Many people in the world do not want to use Artemia biomass when it comes from an area where there are the shrimp farms. Mm -hmm. Can you document, can you say that uh, a lot of your clients in Thailand are shrimp farmers and do not have that concern? Okay, okay. Uh, difficult to say, eh? but in fact, I, I saw my uh, biomass to will stock farm uh when am i when am i and you you may know about uh infection of uh uh esp right esp yeah um about i don't sure three years or four years ago someone found that uh contamination of esp in atina biomass but uh my my result uh, not like that because I do something. I did. I did something like a challenge test. Uh, the people who who, who bought uh, Artemia biomass for me to feed their uh, blue stock. Uh, of course, in Thailand they have to uh, check uh, anything uh, for healthy for blue stock for uh, no pi. Uh, for me, after three years, I think about three years already, um, no one said about contamination of ESP from blue stock that feed by Atime biomass. Never. I never seen. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. yeah. Well, and uh, um, I was also referring, and I think uh, Pam was mentioning it in her presentation, at least I recall that she showed some figures of, uh, and maybe I don't pronounce the name properly, the Bonchong farm, where already more than 20 years they are producing their own Artemia. Pam? Yes, uh, now he uh, produced uh, Artemia biomass and sell to the bullstock, uh, both with Pinus Vanamai and also uh, Pinus Monodon. And uh, also he sell to the ornamental fish as well. So for him, uh, is go quite uh, quite uh, with a good uh, performance. Yeah, so uh, uh, I think it was also a suggestion that uh, Li Ying was making. Uh, um, one of the things that uh, we should do as the uh, International Artemia Aquaculture Consortium is publish a paper where we can properly document on uh, uh, the quality of of uh, Artemia biomass produced at a high salinity. This is probably the key word because it is at high salinity. And, and this is an important information for the shrimp farmers in India, but also for the shrimp farmers in Latin America who now ban the import of any Artemia biomass coming from, uh, from Asia. Um, Nasser, are you still around? Hello, Nasser? Maybe not. Hello? Because I wanted to ask him uh, about um, the different species that are farmed in uh, Iran and uh, why he said that um, there is prohibition to do Artemia culture near the shrimp ponds. But okay, maybe uh, uh, we can hear about uh, later. Um, there was a question how to integrate uh, with mud crab farming. Maybe, Hoa, could you address this? And at the same time, some people were wondering how it comes that um, 
you can uh, sell the cysts at such a high price, the Vinchao cysts. Kuba? Bay non. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, actually, there are two points that I like to mention for the application of Asimia for Mudgra in uh, Vietnam, I mean in Vinchao and Bac Liu area. So, uh, first of all, that uh, for the mudcrab hatchery, uh, tend to the small size of Artemia seed produced in Vinchao. So, therefore, now uh, they can do the incubation up to the state of umbrella. So, in that state, normally that the size is uh, more or less like uh, rotifer, which usually uh, apply for the mudcrab hatchery. And uh, to compare with what they have applied, uh, um, Rotifer, normally that it uh, bring a lot of problem to the material hatchery because first of all, the culture cycle uh, it uh, get uh, easily to get uh, uh, collapse or they get, can get contamination or disease etc. Why to do the uh, hatching of Artemia until umbrella stay is quite easier. Okay, and second, uh, the question is when you ask how to integrate with the Minecraft uh, culture, actually that we are consider about the effluent from the Minecraft uh, culture because they are uh, full of nutrient, algae or organic matter uh, from the effluent can be considered uh, available nu uh, nutritional uh, resources before we bring into the activity pool. Instead of the hair to drink water from the fertilizer of our system. Yeah, okay. Yeah, thank you, uh, Hua. And Musumi Das, can you please mute? Musumi Das, can you please mute the microphone? Hi, Patrick. I mute everyone. Now maybe you unmute yourself, so please. Okay, I'd like to continue on what uh, Hoa was mentioning about uh, integrated farming, because this is something that uh, FAO is uh, propagating a lot, and that has not immediately something to do with uh, Artemia. Uh, it is, uh, uh, for example, an intensive shrimp farming, the zero exchange systems, integration of shrimp with fish and uh, seaweed. But this is where, uh, and I remember it was uh, Kunanan a long, long time ago, uh, who was demonstrating in Thailand that the effluent of shrimp ponds uh, still containing not only uh, nutrients, but particularly also a lot of algae, uh, that this is an excellent uh, medium for artemia culture that eventually then uh, through further evaporation can uh, be connected with uh, a salt farm. So I think that this is something that we should also recommend and try to uh, demonstrate for example, in uh, the project uh, in Bangladesh and, and, and maybe some others um, where uh, we could link Artemia and salt production with uh, uh, be it marine fish farming, be it crab, uh, mud crab farming or uh, shrimp farming. Certainly a point uh, that we should further uh, look into. Betty, are you there? Hello, Betty? Yes, I am. Yeah. Well, you were mentioning uh, you were mentioning about uh, the small scale production, but uh, um, I was a bit intrigued to see that you were mentioning. Well, on one hand, the big salt farms oh, they are not very interested in uh, in cis production, but they are involved. And you were referring to both um, uh, Tanzania and uh, Kenya in biological management. Can you briefly explain? Because uh, some of the people here, some of the participants here, might wonder what. What are they doing with their team as biological management in a salt farm? Yeah, so uh, our system is uh, solar salt production, uh, which is using seawater. So typically uh, the, the process of solar sea, uh, salt production involves evaporation and uh, fractional crystallization. So the ones that, well, they normally get the water from a creek using either you know, gravity or pump it. And then in a serial way, have evaporation ponds where the evaporation 
uh, the salinity moves from say the seawater is received at around 35 to 40 ppt and then the first evaporation pond would say have 50 ppt then once the water evaporates say for one week it's moved to the second which is a higher salinity of 70 to 80 and then 100 150 and so forth until it reaches the uh, crystallization ponds for sodium chloride uh, at over 200 ppt so what happens is um when the water from 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 the tide comes in it has a lot of algae and there is a lot of algal bloom which is not so good for salt making and uh, some of the big salt farms actually almost closed down because of this algal bloom at one point so what they do is have atemia introduced in the salinities of about 80, where they avoid their predators or, or like fish and so forth, because uh, they cannot uh, resist the osmoregulatory uh, pressure of high, high salinity. So atemia survives by this uh, osmoregulatory uh, feature that it has in higher salinity water. So between uh, 80 ppt to around 150, we have atemia that actually eats all the algae and when once it, the salinity of the water reaches high in the higher evaporation ponds from around 200 uh, ppt and so forth this atemia can no longer resist uh, cannot survive the osmotic pressure and it dies and then what happens is that the substrate from the dead atemia uh, is a good thing for the halobacterium which forms this red coloration and absorbs the heat for you know and, and, and then it forms salt crystals that are larger and cleaner. That is how the biological management is done. Thank you. I hope that uh, Thank you. Uh, I will try once more. Nasser, are you there? Hello, Nasser? Yes, yes, I'm here, Patrick. And did you hear my question? Uh, sorry, no. Well, um, <laughs> exactly. Uh, two, two, two points that I want to uh, bring up. Uh, you mentioned that the government is prohibiting artemia culture near shrimp farms. Why? Yes. Yeah. Uh, this is the veterinary organization of Iran. You know, they think that maybe artemia could be a carrier of some sickness like white spot. And therefore, they are a bit afraid. Although we try to explain them a lot that uh, if uh, they, can, they can have a full control on the farm and they can do continuous testing, but they don't want to make any risk some, because they feel that sometimes it has happened before. Maybe some cysts were imported or some biomass were imported, frozen biomass, and that has caused problems in south of Iran in the in shrimp farms. Uh, the white spot uh, almost uh, caused very severe mortality in the uh, in shrimp ponds, and therefore they are a bit afraid, although it is not logic, and we are trying to convince them, but they say at least you should have a 500 meters of distance from the shrimp farm or fish farm. Yeah, well, uh, we, we were just discussing, probably that uh, you didn't hear when uh, Li Ying was finishing, uh, um, it is the consortium that uh, should come up with some better evidence, because there is very good documentation in Thailand, for example, as it was mentioned by Tanan and by Pam, that uh, uh, some shrimp farms for the past 20 years uh, uh, are producing artemia biomass just meters away from shrimp farms, but the artemia biomass is produced at high salinity. And, but we need to better document. Um, then yeah, my, yeah, my sure. next question is, uh, um, uh, in Iran and in pond production, you have experience with three species. Uh, you said uh, in the south, uh, Franciscana, uh, and then inland uh, with Parthenogenetica and Urmiana. Is there a reason uh, to uh, uh, use one in a particular region and not in another region? Or uh, are there other uh, arguments or uh, reasons for a particular selection? Yes. Uh, see, in the north and uh, northwest uh, of Iran, where Urmia Lake is there, because Ur Artemia urmiana is one of the seven bisexual species of Artemia and mainly in Urmia Lake. So in order to preserve that and not to mix up with any other uh, invading, invading, for example, like, uh, like Artemia franscana, uh, it is strictly prohibited. 
that we have to culture only local Artemia, that is Francisca, uh, that is Artemia ormiana and partenogenetic Artemia, because both of them are existing in the same area and inside the lake also. Uh, but in south of Iran, uh, we don't have uh, local Artemia at all. Uh, even partenogenetic Artemia is not existing in the coastlines uh, of the uh, Persian Gulf and the Oman Sea, uh, or even not very, maybe even up to five, six hundred kilometers away from the coastline also, there is no any local Artemia. And therefore, uh, and Vietnam Artemia, uh, I mean Artemia Franskana of uh, Vincho, uh, the, the climate condition is uh, very much, not exactly, but uh, quite similar to the south of Iran. And therefore we found that uh, introduction of this species could be of high value, both in terms of the production value and also uh, their tolerance to higher uh, temperature because south of Iran is very hot and uh, Artemia urmiana really doesn't tolerate that heat uh, but Artemia franskana has done very well. So these are the main reasons. Yeah, thank you Nasser. Uh, I think we should uh, uh, round up here. Um, this has been a very, very interesting first workshop on uh, Artemia pont and uh, uh, tank production. Um, I think we, are, uh, we all come to the conclusion that there is still uh, a lot of challenges, that there is still a lot of items that require further study. So uh, what I'm asking you all is uh, please send uh, your uh, name, affiliation and email address to uh, uh, Ms. Anur or to me because we want to uh, make a, a list of participants. The plan is also to uh, make a brief report because there are a number of issues uh, think about uh, feet. I think feet is really something we need to focus more uh, both uh, on uh, uh, feet for the pond production um, when it is 30% of the cost, as we heard from uh, Hoa in Vietnam. This is really uh, uh, an opportunity to look for alternatives. Uh, the interesting work that uh, uh, we heard from uh, Sunny on uh, the waste, the byproducts, not waste products but the byproducts from agriculture. So uh, it is the intention that in the report, we uh, um, come up with uh, a number of the issues that have been discussed, a number of the challenges uh, brought, to get, brought together because there is a lot of overlapping. And this is all then in uh, preparation of the FAO workshop that uh, will be organized at the occasion of the Global Conference on Aquaculture. So uh, this is a great opportunity for the Artemia community that uh, we will uh, be able to uh, uh, come up with uh, recommendations uh, on future work with Artemia. So please, all of you, I see that we were more than 50 participants, sent in that uh, information by email, and we will then uh, uh, send you the report and uh, the um, location where you can download uh, the presentations. Uh, Thank you very much, and I hand over for uh, uh, the final closing to Ms. Andrew. Uh, thanks, uh, everyone, Patrick, and uh, all participants, uh, all presenters. I'm uh, really glad and really proud of all of you for all your excellent contribution. It reaches much more than we expected. The number of participants online more than 50, sometimes this is 56. And in presence presentation, uh, participants is about 30, so about 90 participants, which is quite high. And I, I'm really also proud at the same time as a Ghent alumni to see that everyone in every corner in the world has been contributing to the aquaculture. That's great. Okay. And then um, this is uh, for sure has encouraged the Artemia Pro Bangladesh project staffs then they can see they are not alone here in Bangladesh, try to solve Artemia production and also contributing for the aquaculture. There are many countries have been doing this. So we are not alone, we are not also, and also we, are, we have a lot of friends across the world. So we see, and then I also realized that for sure is that, that for this type of research and innovation and adaptive work, we really has to have a, we really need to have a consortium together and co coordination and 
cooperation among the knowledge sharing, research and innovation for every corner, including academicians and also in the field level. That will be really helpful. And here, there are several Artemia farmers present here in Bangladesh. Of course, they are not, cannot speak to you in English, but they can understand something, at least by see and pictures and present uh, photographs, that they have been seeing that the Artemia is produced in, in many different countries. Of course, there are questions, there are limited difficulties. The time, with the time, we will address that. So that's really excellent. I would like also to en encourage you, whoever feels that you will be benefited and if there is a win-win situation for you to collaborate with Artemia for Bangladesh project, I will try my best to extend the collaboration, whoever it is in which parts of the world, anywhere is possible. That's also my small sen sentences. Of course, the, the idea is not to give you a speech. So the idea is to thank all of you for all of your excellent cooperation. Of course, the, the, the sentences will be less, uh, not sufficient to uh, acknowledge Patrick Sorglos. Okay. So he has been, you see that he uh, has been still energy, mm -hmm. energized, you know, officially retired, you know, <laughs> but he's still supporting everywhere. So that's also an encouragement for us. You know, we don't have to feel tired and aged. We still have to continue as long as we can. So thank you very much for on behalf of uh, our, team, our team and also I also have to acknowledge uh, you, Patrick possibly would like to say one cent few sentences. For me it is fun. I also really feel proud that this is an opportunity for me to introduce Bangladesh in such an international audience. Just as a Bangladeshi national, I am also proud for that. This is also should acknowledge to the Wallfish giving me the scopes and also my hierarchy like uh, Christopher Price or anybody in our headquarters in Penang, they are all, I acknowledge all of them there for contribution from many different angles. Thank you very much, Patrick. If you want to say a few words, that's okay. No, the, the last thing I want to ask, if everyone could switch on the camera and uh, then we can uh, take a picture of uh, all. Um, so I wait until the first screen is full with all the cameras. And All right. I will okay. do a, a print screen. I'm waiting for uh, Betty. I'm waiting yeah. for uh, Nasser. I'm yeah. waiting for most, uh, Tanam. Most disable the camera, my camera. <laughs> Mizanor, please. Hello. Ah, yeah. camera Francisco, if you can just switch on your camera. Sure. Um, yeah. Okay, and I go my now camera, to the second screen, just a moment. So, uh, uh, yeah, a few more, please switch on the camera. My camera is disabled okay. by the host. I cannot. Uh... <laughs> okay, so um, great, good evening, good afternoon, thanks to all. And send your uh, email address and name and uh, we will submit the report and uh, the further details. All the best and take care. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Very much. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.